again saying we're glad you're here. And uh, we hear and, and read some things, but I promise you, every board member knows that folks that are here, that you'll have concerns and we'll listen to you. So you may get, those that are speaking tonight, you'll get three minutes, but we have other times that other, and think about us, we're working folks that's out there doing stuff just like you are. I've got several different jobs, a family, and serve at church and other places, and I'm serious about that, but I take time for my community too. So don't don't go to somewhere and gather up and say these folks won't listen because I promise you we will. All right. I didn't get an agenda, so we'll share, we'll share this when they do it. I call this meeting of the Mount Vernon Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present. That this meeting has been duly called and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. At this time, we need a motion to certify the agenda. <coughs> That's made by Brooke, seconded by Robert. All four. That's 7 0. At this time, Leanne, will you lead us in a prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for allowing us all to gather here tonight, Lord. I want to thank you for a great start to the school year and your protection of our school and our students. And right now, Father, I want to pray your word over this room for the board members and the people in here. That wisdom come into our hearts. Knowledge be pleasing to our souls. Let discretion watch over us and understanding guard us. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight we're blessed to have some of our MFA students. Uh, February is, is National FFA Month, and our FFA officers actually joined us here for a meeting. They sit beside us. We take a little extra time and kind of show them what's going on and mess with them a little bit. But they're going to lead us in a prayer tonight, and then they've got a, or just excuse me, lead us in a pledge, and then they'll bring us to, they're going to go somewhere else to do some service or something local. So, ladies? Shelby McAdoo, come forward, please. Right here in front of everybody. The largest board meeting we've had in several years, just for you. That's right. All right. It says Miss McAdoo brings her best to school every day. Both students and staff alike want to be around her, as her positivity and dynamic energy are infectious. Shelby's leadership skills and eagerness to succeed make her an asset to our team. Star design, no big deal. She is dedicated to professional growth and tackles every challenge head on. Shelby has initiated her own learning and shared with other teachers to make sure all third grade students are prepared for the new assessment. Her strong organizational skills, content knowledge, and solid routines and procedures in the classroom <coughs> is the ultimate recipe for student achievement. In addition, she truly cares for her students, is a natural at building relationships. Miss McAdoo is a game changer. <coughs> So our elementary teacher of the month, Ms. Shelby McAdoo.
they say so much during the day they get in front of this crowd and they just don't want to say anything. All right, next we're going to do the middle school teacher of the month. If I can have Mr. Mark Bates come forward. Since Mr. Bates is an outstanding teacher and coach, he is always available to help any student, including students, who may need assistance outside his teaching assignments. If he doesn't feel he knows the correct response for a different subject, he is quick to find someone who has the answers. Mark is also a tennis coach, outdoor adventure teacher, and science teacher. He fills in as bus driver when transportation has a shortage and is always willing to step in to assist in tutoring students anywhere there is a shortage. He tutors students in all grade levels and steps up to cover all school detentions while assisting students make better choices and supervises them while doing their assignments. Mark takes his commitment to Mount Vernon ISD very seriously. He can always be counted on to assist our students in any way. When asked if he could help out, his response is always, I will do whatever you need, just let me know how I can help. Mark is a, va a valuable team member to the middle school staff. Mark goes above and beyond the defined boundaries of his duties and responsibilities. With all of the extra things he does each week, he is always well prepared for each class and relies on kindness and structure in every, in every lesson. Mark takes time to develop and implement a creative instructional strategy and approach to his lessons, all to ensure the success of his students. His colleagues eagerly send out compliments on him for assisting with lessons, computer issues, and numerous other kindnesses. Mark serves as a positive role model and leader on our campus who has the ability to build relationships and encourage students both academically and socially well beyond the job requirement. We are very fortunate to have Mark as a valued member of our middle school team. Middle School Teacher of the Month for this month, Mark Bates. anything? Glad y'all all came out. <laughs> <laughs> since, since we do have such a large crowd, let me take this opportunity to mention on something about his as a bus driver. We do need bus drivers. So if any of you would like to go get your CDO or if you, are, no, if you already have it, please get in touch with Mr. Bobby Thompson because we could always use some bus drivers. So it is a very rewarding job. <laughs> right, Mr. Bates? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next, we're going to recognize our high school teacher of the month. If I could have Miss Stephanie Dixon come forward, please. She brought her entourage tonight, so that's right. Says Miss Dixon has established herself as an integral part of the staff at Mount Vernon High School. On a daily basis, she works incredibly hard to deliver high-quality instruction to her students in her various animal science ag classes. Ms. Dixon has demonstrated a desire to consistently improve her teaching practices and is quick to accept feedback, seek out professional development, and collaborate with colleagues in order to better herself and her students. Outside the classroom, Ms. Dixon always handles her professional responsibilities in a timely and efficient manner. In addition to being an excellent classroom teacher, she works countless extra hours outside of school time leading various FFA leadership events and competition teams. She works with young farmers and future ag students by volunteering with 4-H and area animal shows. In addition, she spends much time finding ag-related scholarship opportunities for students, along with overseeing students compete at state and national levels of FFA. In addition to all her duties already, Ms. Dixon has demonstrated a desire to grow her leadership capacity in the area of CTE and has begun assisting the CTE director in a number of areas, including planning, compliance, programs of study, and certification. Ms. Dixon is the number one supporter for all her students, and she has a way of connecting with her students, and they are quick to respond to her leadership. She is an excellent communicator with administration and peers alike, and can always be counted on to help with any extra duties that are, that are necessary. She has a genuine desire to see her students succeed both in and out of the classroom. We are forced to have Ms. Dixon as a member of the Mount Vernon High School staff, and she is very worthy of being named Teacher of the Month for the Mount Vernon High School. I'm just really glad that all of you are here. Um, uh, honestly, these, these students right here are my, my driving force each and every day. And um, what you have to say tonight, I don't know if you know this, but we have a competition that's actually called Agricultural Issues, and we get to use what's going on right here in this county as our subject material for some of our competitions. So I really uh, am gonna value the words that you have to say tonight, and I appreciate everybody that's able to come. Right, thank you. Now we get to 
recognize probably one of the hardest working employees we have in Mount Vernon ISD and a very important person, especially when it comes to football season and tickets. And um, because she fills lots of phone calls and lots of questions, especially when are we going to sell them, right? If I could have our this month month of October uh, support member of the month, Miss Michelle Cupid, if you'll come forward, please. <laughs> Ms. Cupid is more than deserving of being honored as the Auxiliary Employee of the Month for Mount Vernon ISD. She is a tireless worker and can be counted on 100% of the time to take care of all her daily responsibilities and any additional things that pop up on any given day. She handles subs, purchasing, grades, senior activities, football tickets, and many other duties, including Mr. Glover. No, I added that. <laughs> I added that for you. Everyone in Mount Vernon High School knows that if they have a question, then Miss Cupid is the person who can probably get them answers. She has a pleasure to work with and always has a positive demeanor with staff, students, and parents. We're extremely fortunate to have Michelle to continue to be a part of our team at Mount Vernon High School and thankful for all that she does. Our monthly support member of the month, Ms. Michelle Cupid. <laughs> Hang on, if I can have all recipients come back up, we'll get a picture with the board here real quick. <laughs> Understanding 775 of these signatures are from taxpaying residents of our county. I can only imagine how many more we would have by now if the county taxpayers were informed of the solar complexes when they were first proposed. I also understand that uh, last month on the 12th, <coughs> the school board approved an amendment to expand these solar complexes even after we brought concerns to the school board and had a lot of questions that were unanswered. Um, I'm kind of curious on why we would do that. I know this isn't a question and answer forum. But um, ba basically what I, what I really want to say is d dirty green energy is not wanted in this county. It's, it's unreliable, it's inefficient, and if you don't believe me, just look what's about to happen in Europe. I mean, they shuttered their coal power plants, they shuttered their nuclear plants, Putin cut off the spigot and their solar grid can't keep up. Now they're scrambling to get their coal-fired power plants back up, their nuclear power plants back up, and why would we want to bring that into this county when it really has no benefit for the county as a whole? Yes, the school district's going to get some money, and, that, and that's great, uh, but really, this is going to take up thousands of acres of land in this county, and yes, the homeowners and the landowners, they, they do benefit from it, but the rest of us don't benefit from it. Not say, I'm not saying I want to benefit from it, but are we really willing to let our county be changed for decades 
for these solar projects, and we still don't have any answers. We don't have any answers on where the water's coming from, uh, who's going to dispose of the panels when they break, if there's a tornado, a hailstorm, kids with BB guns. We don't have any of these answers. There's toxic chemicals in these batteries and in these panels. That the batteries you need special firefighting equipment to put out. Do we have that in this county? We don't. Who's going to pay? For, who's going to pay to buy the new the hazmat equipment and the, and the special fire suppressant that we need to put these batteries out if they catch on fire? And just last week in Monterey County, California, there was a fire at a battery storage facility, and the, the local sheriff had to tell the citizens to shelter in place, shut your windows, turn off your air conditioner, and do not come out until we come and knock on your door and tell you it's safe. Luckily, that county had enough money that they had the proper fire equipment that they paid for to put the batteries out. So these are all things that we need to consider. I understand $34 million is a lot of money. I'm sure that you know the homeowners and landowners stand to make a lot of money, but is money really worth it? Is it really, really worth it? Because we're gonna put our future in inefficient, unreliable energy that is also toxic. So I mean, that's really all I have to say. I just hope that you know everybody would think hard about this and take everybody that's gonna to speak today's uh, opinions into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next up will be Josh Flowers after Mr. Colvin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, basically, a lot of what I feel is the same as the gentleman before me said, but I cannot see for the life of me how putting that plant is of any benefit to the people in Franklin County, period. The only thing I shouldn't say that, because the farmers that are going to either sell or at least their hand, they're going to make a lot of money off it, but for the general tax-paying public of Franklin County, I can't see any benefit to it, and I do know how to look at business, because I ran my own business for 25 years, and it was a very successful business in Dallas. Uh, but uh, the contractors are going to make money off it, they're going to put it up there. They're probably also going to get a kickback from the government, because the government seems to kick back to people that do things for the so-called economy and for the you know, ecology of the country. They always want to kick back money, so they're probably get a kickback there. But as far as all of us that are sitting in this room, that is general taxpayers, I can't say it's a any benefit to any of us. And I urge you to vote against giving any tax break to them. But sooner or later, as a school district, you're going to need money. And that means it's going to have to get extra tax increases for everybody in this group. Flowers? Um, I'm new to the county, but I will tell you this. The solar farms that were I came from, I've seen what they do, what they look like. Uh, very cool. But I know with state law that you can only have 800 acres of solar farm, even though it's 5,000 acres that they're asking. Why do I know this? Because it's near me. Um, so really, what I want to know is how many years is it going to be there? When does it start? How long is it going to be? How much are you, you really going to be having for the school district after three years? Um, if it was in something else, say, development for a subdivision, wouldn't we have more for the school district and the county? You know? So, you know, overall, there's only a couple of employees going to be there. 200 at first, but they get fired. They're temporary workers. They don't stick around. Also, these solar farms can go bankrupt, and they can be taken over, foreclosed. The one near White Squirrel right now has been foreclosed three times, and it's left in disarray. So, personally, I don't really want to see that. I'd rather see something else going there. I understand about agriculture, but really a big component of it. But really, I think there's ways we can do more for the county and for the school district. Um, the other is, what's the property value for those neighbors to it for resale? That's, I mean, that's one thing else that a lot of people don't understand. Don't look at it. You don't really get a lot. No one wants to go buy a be lived by a solar farm. The other is what kind of environmental impacts are going to be happening? What's going to happen to the birds that fly over? What about, you know, you put up a big fence around it, what happens to the rest of the deer that are there? Where do they go? So I think those are things that need to be thought about. 
If this company can come in and do stuff, why do they need a tax break? Why not just do it? Just build it. Don't need anything. You would get more in return if they just built it and you taxed it. Your taxes would be a lot more, more revenue for the school district and for the county. So the other is, is those landowners that, have, that this is on, they have to pay three years back taxes. So for that landowner, I'm not sure I want to pay that three years for it. Why was that guy? So that's what I've got to say. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I think mine is fairly positive and short. Forgetting about the solar fields, my first question is why do we always need money? We may want a lot of things, but what do we actually need? Now I'm speaking for the people and students of Mount Vernon, Franklin County, Texas, including you, our school board. I'm sure the folks of Franklin County would love to hear a shopping list. I've also, I've heard AstroTurf for the football field, move the home stands, etc. Maybe y'all have listed those things, and I somewhere and I missed it. My mother told me if I bathed and wore clean clothes, I'd always be just as good as anyone. Our school system and physical plan is something like that. Keep it running smooth and clean as you're doing now with maintenance and good direction. You and your system has produced some good and great and exceptional people that we can all be proud of. And we have always produced those folks with what we have had at the time. Our school system has produced doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs. Okay, maybe no Indian chiefs, but many great athletes, scholars, aviators, politicians, judges, and generals. And I repeat, we have done it all with what we were working with at the time. Let's make the best use of what we have and we can still be proud of our school. Thank you. Susan Olson. Next up is Ruth Green. Good evening. My name is Susan Olson. Born in Dallas, recently returned to the land of the free to find this. I want to say that in a previous life, this was my line of work. These folks here from NL and uh, attorneys who are doing the work and you know, any other project sponsors here have heard every single argument, every single criticism, every single word that we could think of as normal, everyday citizens to oppose something like this. And believe me, because I used to do this for a living, we have nice pat answers. But all you really need to know about what they think of you and your level of understanding is in this nice little handout we got. Utility scale solar. On the last page, at the very top, it says, can the project move forward without county approval? Listen to how this sentence is structured. If the county is not zoned, there are no permitting requirements for the project beyond state and federal permits, and they throw in fun, including stormwater management. So what that says is, they don't need your statement permit. They have no answers for you. They're here to be polite under the guise of listening to local concerns. And I suspect the school board is as well. Shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. 
I don't want this in my county. I don't want this in my state. And I'm going to fight you every step of the way. Thank you. Yes. Transparency. No one has talked to me about my land. Uh, I have spoken to no one, so I have no interest in that direction. Um, now, what I want to uh, mention real quick is, first of all, see, I'm really not in favor of economic development. That's on principle. I did that stuff for 25 years in the city of Irving, and I saw how it worked, and it never worked the way it was intended to work. And so, on philosophy, I don't like it. Uh, let me say, this is really a tax issue. It's not a land use issue. Uh, Sue rightly pointed out, in the state of Texas, unless there are only a couple of instances where the county has zoning authority out in the county. That is, authority to tell you what you can use your land for. So Franklin County doesn't have that. Uh, this, county, this county commissioners cannot tell you you cannot put a chicken house here or you cannot put a you know, a boarding house here. They don't have that authority. And likewise, they don't have the authority to say, you can't put a solar farm out here. That's the way Texas is. But by default, you ladies and gentlemen, you have the pleasure of being the fulcrum point in this, ar this argument, which is really a tax. Section 313 of the uh, state code says that the school district has the ability to grant certain tax relief okay and uh, if they don't grant that then uh, you don't I assume they don't get their money <laughs> now I will tell you that there are fa federal tax incentives that are fairly <coughs> substantial you add those in the local tax incentives and that's that's a lot of money that's why they're coming to you to talk to you they could do this without coming here they could go and get their permits and start building tomorrow all they have to do is work out the contracts with the individual owners. So, uh, one other fact, 313. Six seconds, Sandy. 313 expires December, the last day of December this year, and the 82nd legislature decided not to renew that law. 
and they did it for a reason because it wasn't working like they intended it to. Been over 44 years in local government, like the previous gentleman there, and I don't want to be part of the NIMBY crowd, not in my backyard, just because it's a new idea. I'm not really opposed necessarily to solar. What I am opposed to is not having some pretty substantial questions answered, and I have two major concerns. Number one, and yes, I'm a transplant from the Metroplex. I didn't play football here or anything like that. <laughs> but I still own property here, live here, and pay taxes here. And I live on the lake. And it's a lake that struggles. And it's, I could be wrong on this, but it's my understanding that a sizable or disproportionate amount of property taxes are paid by people that live on the lake. You take that water out of the lake, and no one can tell me how much water you're going to take out. I mean, I, I hope they can. You guys tell us exactly how much water you're going to take out. Anyway, that's one of my questions that has not yet been answered. The second part is the board put forward a school bond, and my wife was a principal. I'm very much in favor of what school districts need. They put forward their legacy. Y'all put forward your legacy project projects, things that you wanted to accomplish as members, and the citizens voted it down. When somebody votes for a bond project, they're also implied that they are agreeing to pay for the future tax raises for the increased maintenance on that new uh, buildings or whatever they build. This completely, to me, circumvents it. You guys, and I say y'all, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but you get the money to build your projects. You're given tax abat abatements that would help pay for the maintenance of those projects and you know, on down the road, and you have the citizens left, taxpayers holding the bag. Mm -hmm. So there again, I, and by the way, I really wasn't upset until I started reading this thing. And in the second paragraph, I'm like, really? You would make a statement like this that is as see through and transparent as anything. And in the last one, should I be concerned about my I don't even get to that. This was obviously written one side by someone that wasn't doing a realistic viewpoint of trying to pros the cons. I haven't seen a con in here. So anyway, that's uh, my two cents worth, and I hope that you guys will consider particularly what the voters have told you already about these projects you're putting forward, and also about what you may do to property values in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Harold Duke. On board is Pamela. Yeah, I have a question. Why are we giving a secondary tax break when our government is already funding these projects. So the government's already stepped in and given them subsidy, subsidized the project, but yet they're asking you, the county now, to step in and give them. And I don't understand why y'all are not focusing on um, that part of it. Then to let you know, I talked to Farm Bureau, the insurance agency, and the Farm Bureau for our land. They're against tax abatements. They do not believe that tax abatements are should be passed through school districts. It's not only your school district, it's all the school districts in the state of Texas that are passing these abatements. And then you're putting all the school children, you're stealing the money from them for the future. You're stealing billions of dollars. Instead of it going back, let them pay the full tax and let them distribute it out through the state of Texas, you're taking money from the next county. You're taking money from the kids in the next county. So instead of letting in another question, which you can't answer. Are you gonna give your school, school teachers raises? Across the board, are all your school teachers, the ones that are working hard, are you giving them raises from this money? At the end of the day, you can't give them a raise because you can't guarantee the money will return back. Sorry, I'm a little nervous, I don't talk in front of that many people. So, 
And then another question I have here. Have y'all hired an outside tax consultant to tell y'all, you know, what you're looking at, what your money would be on both sides? So what your tax abatement brings in versus what the money would be brought in if you let them pay the full tax. That's all I have to say. Sims, she wants to pass. Pam's passing right. Yes, Mr. Sims is next, and then David Truesdale will be after or Tony. Guys, I'm really not used to public speaking. And the tax basic thing, I can look around this audience here. Lowe's, Caitlin, got that very same thing. They, when I left there a year and a half ago, there were 1,300 people working in that building. My understanding is, with all of us here, there's going to be four employees left to take care of everything that has been done with the social family. My other concern is this. I've lived here. I can show you my great-grandparents' grave in North Franklin County. They were all farmers. My family's all been farmers. We're concerned about the environment. I, for one, do not believe that you can run water over solar panels for months and months and months and not get some kind of run off. They say they can contain it. Tornado comes through and blows those panels all over the country. Who's going to take care of it? There is small projects, small, small acreages all around me. My next door neighbor has 13 acres. Right next to him is 300. That man does 300 acres of solar panels. What's going to happen to the 13 acre man? The little guys. I know that the bond did not pass. It came during a time of the pandemic, during a time of possible recession. Everybody concerned about money, and here comes the bond. <clears throat> For the first time in my life, I'm standing here with this school board. This is very important to me, my family, my kids, my grandkids. I would love to be able to pass my properties on to my grandkids. And if I've got solar panels all around, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the 100 acres? What are you going to do? What's going to happen? I know for a fact that and uh, towards Sulphur Bluff, where they're planning on putting some, I'm not sure where the watershed goes exactly, but part of it goes to Sulphur River. Part of it goes through my property. And there's enough contaminants in this world without all of this, I understand there's magnesium involved, I understand there is silica involved, I understand there is uh, sulfuric acid involved. Have a leak, have a tornado, have a hell storm. Who's going to be responsible? Is it going to be us? going to be the company? Money, Thank you, Mr. money is money. Good evening. My name is David Truesdale, and I own the property just south of the proposed solar complex off 1896. As a retired senior leader of men and women who every day put their lives on the line for this country, I know about making critical decisions. I understand the process of gathering intelligence or information, analyzing this information, and then making critical life and death decisions. This proposed solar complex is a disaster in the making. Not only have you not considered the first step of gathering information, but you have either knowingly or unknowingly submitted fraudulent information to the Texas Comptroller's Office, particularly in Section 8, when you submitted Form 50 CAC 296 TAC Alpha, the application for appraised value limitations. 
notarized as true and complete on 9 May 2022. In addition to this submission, you accepted an amendment to this document on 1 September 2022, containing the same suspected false statements and have apparently submitted it also. This new amendment is not really an amendment. It is essentially a complete change to the proposed bill, and I would argue that this would need a complete new request. Submission of a false statement on this application is a Class A misdemeanor or a state jail felony under Texas Penal Code Section 37.10. In order to fulfill the requirement for 313 tax payment, you must approve, only approve those applications that, one, enhance the local community. And if you look around this room, I don't think you've met that. Two, improve the local education system. I think we could argue that to obtain extra money, utilize it only for building structures, and not providing additional pay to our educators, I think we could argue that you haven't met that either. Three, create high paying jobs. Apparently you waive these jobs to one to two. Clearly you've not met that requirement. And four, advance the economic development goals of Texas. Here I may argue that bringing an out of state company in to destroy our local agricultural land cost our community jobs for the people that work those lands and provide services and products to those that work the land. I would argue you've not met that either. Based on your failure to meet any of these requirements, I would say that if you do agree to this proposal, you may be technically stepping outside the scope of your appointment, employment, and therefore be personally liable for any lawsuits that result from this action. As to possible lawsuits which result from your failure to conduct due diligence, I have spoken to three fire departments in this local area, and none are equipped or specifically trained to fight a fire. And two additional ones, but I didn't speak to them. That means in the event of a fire, there is likely to be extensive damage to personal property and or loss of life. You may think that this vote is done, that this goes away. It doesn't. We in this community have moral courage and care enough about the future of this county to keep fighting as long as it takes. <clears throat> close out, I implore you to dig deep and find your moral courage to stand up for what you know is right Thank in your you, heart. Bill. Next up is Andy Stone. changing the rules on the number of jobs. That was a red flag. When you start bending rules, you're in trouble. And that's where I see y'all started out wrong in this thing. Uh, the fact that somebody's giving you money now to give them money later, I hate to say it, it it's cheating, it's a bribe, it's, it's wrong. If the sheriff come in here and said, I knew, need new squad cars and need bulletproof vests, and he takes money from some drug dealers, we'd be wanting to put him in jail. And I think this is simple. Uh, the lake out here is a cash cow for this county. Has been for years. And to take a chance of ruining that, if we got water issues already out there right now, we're down two and a half feet. And it's not getting any better. But finally, in my opinion, is what about the person next door to these things? I ask each and every one of y'all, would you want this panel farm next to your house or next to your farm? What happens when they go in? What do these people, how do they sell their property? Would you buy it? I certainly would. I don't think anybody would. But in closing, I think it boils down to one thing. And I think we've all heard of the golden rule. You know what the golden rule is, is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You guys vote and all remember that golden rule. Mr. Emery, Jim Emery.
Next up will be uh, Joe Borden. Thank y'all for letting us have this time to address you. I am totally 100%, me and my family, all of us are against these things. I don't want to look at them. I don't want to live close to them. I've been on North Franklin Fire Department since it started in 1976. Nobody has approached our department or any other department in this county for any kind of training, for <coughs> any kind of equipment, equipment to fight these lithium batteries is highly expensive. We are barely existing right now, fighting fires and doing things that we're doing right now. We cannot buy this equipment to fight these fires. You can't just put a lithium ion battery out. There's gonna be thousands of them. They don't just go out. These Tesla cars, they catch on fire. Put it out. A month later, it's back on fire. All the carcinogens that's gonna be released, you can evacuate the people around, but we don't even know how big an area you got to evacuate. Yeah, we get the people out, but what about all your livestock and everything that's there that's gonna be breathing in all these carcinogens? You eat that livestock, your kids, your grandkids, so on. What does it do to them? Please, please, do the Christian thing. Stop and think about what you're doing for generations to come. Mr. Borden, you'll stay where he's at right now. Mr. Emery, thank you for your service. Joe. Hey, folks, I don't talk very loud, so listen hard, okay? <coughs> I, I'm going to be talking to, the, to this, this group here. There are only four jobs coming. We've got 16 businesses on a piece of paper that employ more people than that right now. The common denominator is they pay their taxes, and they don't ask for tax deals. Two days ago, a member of this board confided in me that if a vote were taken today, the vote would be 6-1 or 7-0 in favor of so. I hope that's not true. I was also told that I can do nothing to change your mind, so I'm here today to change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Two days ago, something happened really neat in Hagensport, Texas. We had a town hall, good turnout. We've invented something called a rain gauge. It's equivalent to a vote. These are the people. We got four and a half inches of rain in our gauge. The green didn't get the ground wet, I'll put it that way. The interesting thing is that the people who hired this board, or who voted this board in, have absolutely no power. This represents maybe the school board. And you have all the power. And I very humbly ask you, don't do this thing. I ask you as individuals. Um, you, these people that put you in office put their faith in you. They trust you to do the right thing. They trust you to do what they put you in office for. Yet, they have no power. Seven people control all of the power in Franklin County as to this decision. If it came to a 4-3 vote, one person would decide what's gonna happen in Franklin County for the next multiple generations. You're about to make a generational decision that we're gonna take our farm and ranch lands and turn it into solar farms. Don't do that. We sit here today divided into different color hats and things, and I've got a proposal for you. What I propose is that we look for common ground. Maybe we are on the same team. We all want to do what's right for the kids. So 
maybe we uh, take off the red and the green hats and we both put this hat on. We're on the same team, united. Start listening, stop talking past each other. Find common ground because that's the best for our kids and we share that vision. Thank you, Joe. Very good.
And who gets these benefits? A few local property owners, and then the money will go overseas under the federal tax abatements that pay up to 50% or whatever, and then they want an abatement on top of that. School board members, we understand your desire and your need to abate taxes and get big bucks to fund school construction. But do know, we are now actually at about a thousand signatures on petitions to stop solar in this county. This is driving a wedge. We're doing this, and I'm sorry we're doing it. I, 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 Linda Owens is my cousin. I knew her grandparents. But you do have a duty to exercise due diligence. I knew all of you, just like Linda Owens. I knew your grandparents were fossil. Look to the collateral damage if you welcome solar installations. Permanent environmental degradation. Permanent environmental degradation. Disruption of our economy. Destroying our agricultural economy for a limited number of jobs. Four jobs and destruction of the land. In the news, actually yesterday, in the news yesterday, a headline, misleading reports from the solar industry regarding water use. Misleading reports from the solar industry. Uh, we heard uh, the veteran tell us about the handouts and the an analyzing data. It's hard to analyze it. But this is a new technology. And now we're finally getting some reports coming through about the huge water use, the vast water use in one study. Water is the lifeblood for your tax base. Today, Franklin County water, created by Franklin County tax dollars, is pumped to Stampede Solar in Saltello, Texas, the next county. Last week, last week, I didn't know what a best was. You better look it up, friends. I know now. I thought we were only getting solar panels here. At last week's public meeting, the fire chiefs from Mount Vernon and North Franklin both reported on the threats of public safety posed by solar installations. Make sure school board members that you set aside money to cover the damages from fires and battery explosions. 1.5 million panels on 10,000 acres and up to 300,000 batteries under those pending applications. 300,000 lithium batteries in multiple best units. Do we taxpayers put the bill for special firefighting equipment and training? Who pays for the cleanup cost if this company declares bankruptcy? The limited liability companies created to operate here will fold and we won't find the owners in China or Italy or France willing to come forward and pay the money. Lawsuits will follow. Do not sell your souls for solar. something above yourself is a, is a noble thing. Okay, and I want, to, I want you to know I appreciate what you did. Okay, this issue is a political issue. This issue is an emotional issue. This issue has almost nothing to do with anything else. Okay, we all know about Solyndra. We all know about Bound Soul. I could go on and on about all the companies that have failed to deliver this product. At the beginning of this, you asked us all to sign some phones. This was created by a free market, okay? The market does not want something. It, the government keeps trying to kickstart it, all they can to try to get this engine running because they think that it's somehow gonna save the environment or do some other thing, okay? And so what they do is they pull on your heartstrings, okay? And they're using your students to get to you because they know that's the way in. That's the angle that they get to use because they can't bribe you. You probably won't even take a problem, okay? But they sit there and dangle these incentives in front of you and say, hey, we can get you that money, okay? Now, as long as I've been voting, there's always a school bond, okay? And that bond always extends the bond to where the bond will be paid off later, okay? So I think for the perpetual future, the school board will have a bond. You will <coughs> always be in debt. You will always be paying for something. I don't believe this is the vehicle to get that bond ever paid. It may seem like it today, but I ask you this, if you were gonna invest in this company, and if the answer is no, 
that don't invest in this company now. That's all I have to say.
get through. We have a consultant through uh, A&M that's neutral on this stuff, and he's going to come in here. He's heard y'all. He's been listening to this. He's going to listen to them, and then we'll go to him. So, right, don't interrupt the speakers because they're bringing us information. This is a meeting that we're allowed to let y'all participate in. So. You may not agree with them, I may not agree with them, but we're gonna, up, I can ask questions. We'll figure out a way to get y'all some answers. Y'all have, you know, we'll, we'll get the answers probably and we'll figure out a way to get those to y'all. These companies want y'all to know too, hopefully what y'all need to know to appease our questions and desires because this is a very important decision. So, um, Dr. Keller, we're gonna start with. So we'll, we'll start with uh, Zach. And then Nell, if you don't mind, how, how we'll do this slide, you'd have opportunity to come up and kind of share, um, as we kind of talked about, kind of share the board, compose some questions, and we sent those questions to the to each company. We'll ask that you kind of speak towards those and then give the board the opportunity to ask you questions, and then Corey will we'll give you all the opportunity uh, to kind of do the same thing following Zach, and then maybe we can have both at the same time at the end to answer questions uh, from the board, and then we'll give Mr. Brent, Dr. Branson the opportunity to answer Questions as well. Is that okay? Does that you like to come share first? Anthony, do we need to move that mic closer or is he gonna be okay? You can hear okay. I just I've been asking. Okay, good. How are y'all doing? Good. Just if you introduce yourself and who you who you represent, please. Yeah, sure thanks. So my name is Zach Prokofi. I represent an Green Power. I'm our development manager for the project. So Essentially, that oversees the leasing aspect of it, um, and then our development team, which includes a permitting lead, environmental lead, uh, engineering lead, uh, real estate lead, uh, and then a uh, an engineering and construction and permitting lead. So uh, we can definitely get into more of what each of those leads go into, but I, I manage the whole team uh, for uh, Stockyard So Do you all have any questions you want to start off with, or? Um, I know y'all sent over some questions. We'll just get to those. I'd say just go ahead and get into those. If you okay. Want, please. Yeah, that sounds yeah. great. Uh, so you know, water use is a big hot topic here uh, in Franklin County. You know, with these with these solar projects, we have uh, we've been able to use the ponds on the property and just the water resources that are on the leased property uh, that uh, you know that are on the landowner's property. We uh, have been uh, able to do that at South Tillo, right? That's our project at South Tillo. We don't <coughs> pull this water from anywhere else but the ponds. Um, these panels use very little water. Once constructed, you know, during uh, during construction, there is there is some water use, and that's typical for any type of industry that is, you know, doing construction, right? So um, we have, uh, you know, our South Tillo project is roughly the same distance away from Lake Cypress, right, which I know is a big topic. Um, we haven't approached any sort of uh, water district entity here in Franklin County for water there. You know, we're not planning to do the do that here for this project on uh, Daphne Prairie. So. In regard to water, um, you know, one of the concerns that keeps coming up that we keep hearing is, is those panels will have to be washed and cleaned every two hours. Yes, that is not true. You know, uh, being out here in Northeast Texas, y'all get rainfall quite a bit, right? Uh, <laughs> you, get more than, you get more than most other places, right? In Texas. So, uh, but, uh, you know, so we, under, I'm under these circumstances I'm a right example. now with uh, a drought for a month. Yes, yeah, so I'm a great with, example. With so we have, a project, we have a project in Coffin County, right? Uh, that's been operational for a year and a half. Uh, we have not washed the panels once there. It's just, you know, rainfall that's happened every few months has been able to keep the panels clean. Uh, we don't have to wash them every two hours. You know, no one has the time or money or manpower to do that, right? Um, these panels actually stay relatively clean. Uh, and, you know, we uh, we just use natural rainfall on that. Well, so. I have a question regarding the water usage, too. Um, I read something someone said that uh, if the temperature gets over say 90 degrees or a certain temperature that they have to be misted to keep them cool is that true uh again i could bring up our coffin county site that's been in operations for a year and a half you know just went through this summer uh we did no misting out there we just relied on natural rainwater. so 
Another one, uh, another one question ahead. kind of dealt with, you might, if you're about to address this, I apologize. I just want to be sure it was addressed. You know, even through the natural rainwater of Washington, uh, is there containment in regard to, or the question in regard to the possibility of contaminated water? Is that yeah. a possibility? If it is, how is that contained? And yeah, no, that's a great we're question. We're that we get all, that's a great question that we get all the time. So, you know, these panels, the way they're made, they're sealed airtight, right? Um, a lot of the materials that are in the panels actually, you know, aren't toxic whatsoever. Uh, the, uh, the glass is a lot like automobile glass. So when you, if it breaks through a hailstorm or what have you, it kind of shatters all together, right? Now with multiple pieces. Um, and just going to the other question, you know, that's been brought up is we do pay for that. If anything's damaged, right? Obviously, we're not going to make our landowners pay thousands and thousands of dollars for for something that is uh, an property, right? Uh, so that uh, wanted to make sure I answered that there. But um, as far as you know, they can they can withstand 150 mile per hour winds. You know, we have projects off the coast of the Gulf, right? That uh, you know we wouldn't be siding there. If, you know. Territory, right? If we didn't think they could withstand it. Uh, the, you know, the panels are actually pretty durable. Um, they withstand a lot. So uh, the technology has come a long way since, you know, it's, you know, been really kicking off here in the past, you know, 15, 20 years. And uh, it's been a lot, uh, a lot more, you know, innovation in the, in the industry, uh, which has made it a lot more cost effective. So, do you have something to add? Hail storms. Damage yeah. Or yeah. So it goes yeah. back. Goes back to what I was just saying. You know, those are very durable. Um, if anything, you know, if you are getting, you know, softball-sized hail or anything like that, if there is damage. Uh, we, we, you know, that's coming out of our pocket. Uh, yeah, and we so we, we replace it. Hailstorm. Is there any <coughs> chance of any kind of contaminant leaking into the ground? Uh, no, like I said, the happens. materials that we are using in our panels uh, are not toxic, right? Uh, there's, there's very, very little likelihood anything's going to happen there. So can you get into that a little more, like the toxicity, like it, chemicals, so are you saying, is that a myth, like they're completely clean? Or well, it's it's what using, it's using, it's about? using, uh, there's not really any uh, major chemicals in these panels, right? It's all uh, special materials, right? Uh, and like I said, these are airtight, sealed up. Uh, from from the uh, manufacturer, right? Uh, and it does take a lot. You know, like I said, it takes 150 mile per hour wind, things like that. So, who's here from Samsung? Okay, and that's going to be a question we're going to ask him or y'all because that's a big concern concern for everybody in this room, me, the board. You know, I mean, I know this cell phone has a uh, probably a lithium battery in it. I carry it in my pocket put it up next to my head. I know it's probably dangerous, but I almost don't care because I need it so much. But we want to know, you know, when you say, um, yeah, I can talk about there's the some not, there's some yeah. things that's not toxic in there. Well, I'm talking about, about, about the talking about the panel. So on okay. the lithium batteries, um, you know, we keep those in climate controlled, airtight containers, right? Um, that are you know next to our project and the transmission system, things like that. Uh, we have a real time monitoring on site and off-site that, you know, it's real time. So even in, you know, 2 a.m., you know, some one of the batteries goes out or something goes wrong, uh, we uh, we have that real-time monitoring and our guys are usually on-site, you know, to come, to come look at that. Uh, you know, going back to uh, fire mitigation plans and things like that, I know, I know it's been mentioned that we haven't reached out to the fire department yet, you know, that is standard for us to do and, Every state, every county across the you know country, um, the fact that we haven't done it yet doesn't mean that we're not doing it right. Um, you know, we we, we wanted to come to y'all first and, and talk with y'all uh, before we go talk with the county. So, um, as far as fire mitigation plans goes, uh, we have we take all the safety precautions that we that we do. Uh, we do work lo uh, closely with local fire departments on training, things like that. We have we do provide. Uh, you know, emergency responders with uh, the equipment that they need to combat anything that happens is very unlikely. You know, we've done a lot of these battery projects and we haven't had a single incident, you know? Uh, so 
what kind of equipment would you provide to battle this? Yeah, so you know that's really uh, between our HSEQ folks, which is our safety folks, and the fire department on what they feel is different, right? Every fire department has different things, uh, whether it be a truck or uh, maybe an extra fire hydrant out there, right, or something like that. You know, uh, just something that they uh, that they can. Um, it, it it differs from county to county, right, on what they what they want, and what they feel like they need. Say county. Can the school negotiate any of this? Uh, not typically. It's usually we usually deal directly with the, you know, fire department, police department, and all this uh, because they're the state. They know what they what they need, right? So there is though. Even though we can't specify in any kind of agreement, there could be funding available to provide them with the equipment necessary and the training. Yes, and we we do that with with all of our projects, right? We have set, we have money set aside for the fire departments, for the police departments to be able to, uh, you know, be out on site uh, properly and be able to, you know, combat anything they may, they may run up against. And also just to be a good community member, we also like to donate to fire departments and police, police departments. Zach, Zach, can I, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. So, would you introduce well, you yourself, please? Yourself. So, my name is Brian Whitaker. I am actually the site manager out here at the Saltillo Project. Um, I just want to elaborate a little bit on the battery storage system. Um, it is a self-contained unit. It is completely sealed up, and it has its own fire suppression system inside of it. So, uh, if the batteries do explode, if they, there is also a containment. They, they have their own self-containment. So uh, in the case of an emergency, like you said, we do have 24-hour monitoring of those systems. But in the event that something happens with those batteries, it has its own fire suppression system, and it has its own spill containment. So we take every precaution that we can possibly take to keep the environment safe on that aspect of it. Okay. If it does explode and it ruptures the container, mm -hmm. you can't have questions from the outside, Harold. Let me ask you that. I, I'm have, probably going to have the same question. It, I'm sorry, I wish we could knock all this out tonight, but if I let Mr. Duke ask the question, we got to do everybody. So my question thinking about that is, is um, ha has that ever happened before? You know, we're these people in the room, you know, I know if a battery explodes, but what if a hundred of them explode and it, is there any proof that we can get that thing knocked out, get that fire put out? So the battery storage system itself is in a, a completely fenced kind of like a substation with a huge main power transformer in it that supplies all you guys electricity. You know how many, you know how many gallons of oil are in those things? To, uh, it's got its own self-containment pit. It's built inside a fence with, uh, with gravel, uh, berms. If you had all 100 batteries blow up, it's not gonna get outside that containment area. The, when I say containment area, the whole yard. What about air contamination? Air contamination, I know absolutely. If that, in that scenario, what, right. what's the risk there? I don't know. Well, like I said, you know, we have, we have, we have, you know, twenty plus of these right that have been in operation for a while. These battery storage projects, uh, and I'm talking about just straight standalone battery. You know, these are attached to our actual solar projects. You know, um, you know, storing that energy uh, in, in low peak times, but. Uh, <coughs> there hasn't been any issues, right? We haven't, you know, we haven't ran across any of this. We have, we have, like I mentioned, we have a very detailed fire protection plan. We work closely with fire departments, and we have safety as an else, you know, most, you know, renewable companies number one priority, right? Uh, and you know, we don't want our employees getting hurt, other folks getting hurt, things like that. When you say a while, like ten or twenty years, you know, that's what we're wondering. Probably is. Yeah, in yeah. ten years or in twenty years, this thing is still as safe. You know, do we still? What do we have to do to keep it as safe? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's still it's just as safe as you know when you turn the key the first day, right? Um, these some of these bats, you know, standalone batteries relatively new. So I would say you know these projects are around five or so years old, right? So they've been going, um, no, no really any issues. Uh, and you know, we, we do have we do have them attached to our uh, solar project here, so that'll be helpful to work with some of that solar energy during uh, low peak times. Uh, we're moving on here, but you 
mentioned um, that's a producing our electricity. Will we get electricity from these farms, these uh, complexes? Yeah, so that's a great question that we also get all the time. You know, I can speak. I can speak for now. You know, here uh, we do. You know, get some power purchase agreements on projects, right? With a maybe like a a Anheuser Busch. We've done Anheuser Busch, uh, Polar Polaris, things like that, right? But for the most part, in Texas, a lot of our power is merchant. So it's going out onto the grid and settling at either the Dallas hub or the Houston hub. Those are the two main electrical hubs, right? Uh, you know, electrically, we are very close to Dallas. You know, it's not like drive, getting in your car and driving the two hours to get to an hour and a half to get to Dallas, right? Electrically, it's a lot closer than that. Um, you know, the power that gets put on the grid, you know, is used by local, you know, can be used by local co-ops, right? Um, it's really up to the local <coughs> co-ops on, you know, pricing, things like that, of course, right? But uh, I will mention that a lot of our projects are merchant in Texas, so um, we do just sell it over the grid uh, for the local communities to, you know, whoever is between here and Dallas, where it will settle. So then it disperses And the answer I'm kind of looking for is, you know, we're farming, or you're, you're using our resources. You're coming to Franklin County and you're using this. What guarantee do we have when we have another snowstorm? I'm not really worried about <coughs> people in Dallas as I am these people that have put us in these positions that are trusting us for these. You know, this is, we're up here for the school, but if we accept an agreement like this, I need to be able to take care of these people. You know, what, what can we do for them? Is there a way that we can I don't know how you put stuff in the grid that we can have our own grid. We have these batteries. You know, do you have your own battery that when things go south, you say, you know what? We have these panels and they're not doing it for us. That's going to make us, it's going to look, look me look pretty bad. So, yeah. Is there uh, a way? Yeah. So, you know, that's really, you know, on board the big, you know, utility out here, right? No. Um, with the co ops underneath them. Um, and then you have ERCOT, of course, right? So all of that is out of our control. You know, that's really with her thoughts or things like that. As far as the breeze goes, you know, I'm from Sherman, Texas. I that was the first time I've seen it be like that for since I've been alive, right? That type of once in a lifetime type of event. Um, you know, everything shut down in, in Texas, not just you know renewables. You know, the, I know the nuclear power plant shut down. Pipes were frozen for, for oil and gas, everything, right? Um, we're at, you know, with these, with these, uh, with our panels at least, we have, you know, and all across Texas, they're bifacial. So, you know, they actually, um, you know, they get reflect, they're collecting sun from the from the sky, but also can get uh, some of that off the reflection as well. Um, so during that deep freeze, our panels, you know, from that reflection off the snow, actually help melt a lot of that ice uh, there on top of the panel. So we were actually up and running on most of our sites within the, you know, hours after it got you know below 25 degrees right uh negative 25 so okay so that brings up another question you're talking about let's lead into the to the ambient teacher temperature i guess around the sites uh, yes we've, we've yes. all received in you know emails and calls and texts that it's going to be a super hot spot yeah exactly uh so i could definitely answer that for you so um you know a wrap directly in and around the project um there's really there's really no sort of heat. And I can give you an example. So we up in our uh, we have a we have a Minnesota site called Aurora Solar. Um, we've in, we've implemented uh, dual use solar, right? So it's you know native grasses with pollinators, things like that. And also we put sheep out there, right? Um, you know we wouldn't put sheep out there <coughs> if if we thought that they were going to be you know burnt to a crisp, right? And wouldn't eat land chops, you know. So. Uh, that's a pretty big question. You've probably seen that question we've submitted to you, but <coughs> there's it's known that they use animals, or especially sheep, and it kind of goes back to this stuff being toxic. You know, if, if one panel was to bust and there's something in there that's toxic, and that sheep or goat eats that, um, does it? And well, it goes back to, to what I was saying that these aren't really toxic, right? Um, and they're airtight, sealed. Uh, there's there's not really that risk there, right? Um, and going back to the heat that you've mentioned, uh, you know, I can see
see how that's a common thought, right? Because you're you know you're bringing in this the power of the sun, right? Where you know you would think that maybe there could be some heat back off there, but that's just not the case. You know, we do full environmental studies, things like that, um, and we've seen that you know that the you know the local habitat uh, birds, things like that, can still you know fly around and be able to go through this. So. so in the middle of August, if it's 110. Uh -huh. Is it going to be 120 if I'm next to it? Is my house going to? No, no, That's no. the main question. No, no, sir. No, sir. Um, and if it's 110, you're already inside with the AC on anyways, right? So, uh, but uh, going back to the environmental, going back to the environmental aspect of this, uh, so we do full environmental studies from start to finish of our development work. Uh, that is really some of the first work that we do. Um, you know, we do wetlands studies, uh, we do teeny habitat, which is threatened and endangered species studies. Um, and then for this project, everything has come back clean. Um, there's really, there's really nothing um, that has been flagged or anything like that. We we check all the boxes, right? This is a big investment for us, as I'm sure y'all saw on the application. Um, we we like to make sure we are, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's on, on all this stuff. So uh, we do, you know, we do geotech work for the soils things like that. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of things, a lot of moving pieces that go into these solar projects that these folks just aren't, you know, privy to, right? Uh, that, you know, tech, you know, really aren't public because it's, you know, our our you know, our thing to to uh, to do. So uh, but you know you can't just come into you know willy nilly and, and just put something on right. So but what you're saying is <clears throat> is that there have been studies done for Manel at the Stockyard project. Yes. Proposal. Yeah, they're they're all done. Yeah. Yeah. Your panels that you're going to use, um, where where are they? Where are they manufactured or made? So it's a U.S. based uh, manufacturer. Um, that's that's really all. You know, I can definitely give you all more information on that, but they. It is Do y'all know US. Samsung? Do you know where your panels are made? City, state. Decision hasn't been made yet, but yeah. one of the big things that has been coming out is the reinvigoration of American manufacturing of solar farm equipment. So there's a whole lot more options here in the next coming years to actually buy American for this. So again, they're a little bit further along than we are, so a decision hasn't been made yet, but that will continue to be evaluated. Yeah, and we you know we are using a U.S.-based uh, manufacturer for. For these uh, for this project, uh, we're all very excited about it. I, you know, due to some contractual, you know, we're still going through the the motions of all that, right? So I, I can definitely give y'all the name as we get closer to. Uh, but it is a it is a U.S. based uh, manufacturer. Kind of going back to the heat question, on you know, if if, uh, if it's over a certain degree, do the panels quit working, or do they work up to anything where they can stay in? No, forty outside. Will they keep on producing energy? No, that's 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 perfect. Yeah, you know, one hundred twenty outside, sun beat down. Um, great. Yeah, the panels can still operate. So, what about if it's cloudy for ten days? Yeah, so you know you can still get a sunburn when it's uh, when it's cloudy out, right? So it's the same thing with the panels. You know, we can still get some of that electricity uh, out of that. Hey, Mark, while that's on the front of my mind here, we had a uh, during the. Somebody mentioned about 800 acres total, and we've gotten a lot of numbers on these acreages kind of here and there. Uh, so your project is right now about at how many acres? Um, our project is around, currently leased is around uh, maybe like 4,000-ish plus, right? Um, I can get you the exact numbers if you want that. So, so y'all are at about 4,000. Where, where are y'all right now? Do you know? It's in the thousands as well, yeah. 4,000. So uh, that question that was addressed earlier about the 800 acres and permits and whatnot. Yeah, what I, don't, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure where that where that exactly came from. That's I know one of these tracts of land. You know, a lot of them are going to be smaller tracts of land in different areas. I know one tract of land is 2,000 acres. Yeah, well, and I know you can't use all of that and for panels, but is that limited to project or another project? any of them? You know, if it's a large tract of land that's yeah. big enough, I guess know, why, why couldn't we use all of it for uh, why couldn't we use 
development for the panel. Is there meat to what they were saying on this? No, no. Go. And I guess I'd go back to you know, there, you know, people were talking about how uh, there's you know all the big landowners are maybe benefiting from this, right? We have we have over twenty landowners signed up, right? <coughs> with 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 our with our efforts, you know, that's that's a big area, right? They're not all eight hundred megawatt. Uh, landowners, right? There's 30 acres. There's 11, you know, 11 acres mixed into there. So that's not that's not necessarily true. Where we're just using the big landowners, you know, to, to get our project done. So um, we're using a lot of the community there off 1896, um, and um, we we plan on being a community member here for for a while. So, so the last span of the stockyard project is anticipated. To be uh, so our leases run uh, for 30 years, and we have an opportunity to go to 40. Um, you know, our panels can can last about 35 years. You know, you know, probably a little bit longer than that. And at the end of 30, 35 years, what happens? Yes. So that is a question we also get a lot. Uh, and you know, back in September, the Texas Utility Commission uh, passed some legislation there for decommissioning. Um, a big part of that is, you know, we are required by that code uh, to provide a financial assurance, whether it be a letter of credit or bond, by year 10 to each of our landowners for salvage value, reclamation, things like that. Um, there's a lot of other uh, you know, statutes in that code, those two sections, which if we can definitely provide to you, you can attach to the you know, meet, meeting minutes today for everyone. Uh, but you know, even before that, back in September, we already had very strict, you know, reclamation language, right? Um, that's a very common question that our landowners ask because you know they're thinking about their grandkids who will be getting the property after the project's done, and uh, we do try to try to accommodate that and get everything off the property. You know, those those two sections in that code are very strict. Uh, they had it for wind energy for a long time, and then last year they, they had it in um, for solar. Uh, you know, and then after that happened, we we started you know adding that into even our pre that legislation. So what was Neil's first project in Texas? What year was that built? So in Texas, uh, it was 2018, 2019, out in West Texas. Uh, oh, oh, I was talking about as far as solar goes or wind. Solar. Solar. Um, solar was uh, about. 2018, 2019, wind was about 2007. So even, so let's even let's speak specifically in regard to the solar. Is the nail still contractually obligated to that? Are y'all still, that is still your project? Yes, yes, that's still, so that's still. So that, so the best thing about. Else has got that project, you nail still has that project. That's still our project. So the thing about it now is that, you know, we're a developer, constructor, and operator. <laughs> so everything is in house, you know, I was at, you know, Brian here, right? I. I was easily able to, you know, have Brian come over here because everything is in house, right? So, I mean, so let me follow up with what you said regarding. I know this is not, you said it's wind, so I'm going to step out to that in just a second, but just to ask this question because that's been brought up a lot too in regard to what we've heard or the board and I've heard in regard from the community. The 2007 first um, wind project is the nail still a part of that project? So that that project, um, so that was out. Uh, and so that one, so we have one in Kansas, right? That was a little bit earlier, 2006. So Smoky Hills went project. We actually have our, our, all of our landowners wanted to re-up. So we actually went through our life of our lease and they want to re-up. So we have repowered that and have started. Uh, Radio you know, still has that project. Oh yes, yeah, that's, that was one of our original, that's in Kansas. Uh, we have quite a few throughout Texas um, that have been going on. Uh, you know, we had one out in Snyder, uh, Texas, that you know we recently uh, reconfigured to a different uh, crop, you know, different type of energy <coughs> source. Actually, you know, gravity energy. If I can pour your head off about that, but uh, you know, those, those landowners. Um, we talked with all those landowners, and uh, they they were okay with with us doing that. Right, that was really the first project. You know, we really saw a good opportunity for uh, that. That new that newer technology, which we don't have to get into, but we 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 do own operate right. So we developed that project in Kansas. We have developed all these projects in tech across the country, and we still own them. So, 
to that point, if you there's some other technology comes along, what all do you have? Would you have to do to change what you're doing on this land that we're talking about? If you want yeah. to switch it from solar to something else, what does yeah. that look like? So that was a unique case out there, right? We. That we haven't done that anywhere else, and we, we don't we don't plan on doing that here. Um, and that would be all new agreements with the with the landowners, and all that stuff, right? We have no sort of eminent domain or anything over anyone. All this is on private land. They do with you know what they want with their own land, right? Uh, so uh, that was just a unique case. But um, that uh, as far as you know, redoing something else here, that's definitely we haven't done that anywhere else, but that. And would the initial term have to run out before you could do that? The initial term of those original to do what? contracts to switch the usage. To switch the usage, mm -hmm. um, it would take a lot of decisions, right? I mean, we wouldn't just stop an operating, you know, solar project that's producing to, to switch it. Um, we would wait probably until the life of the project was done. That's what happened in the Snyder project. You know, it was a very early wind project where the lease terms weren't as long, right? Uh, they're only about 13 years or so, uh, and we switched it, switched it over, so. Okay, so if, if this comes here and you do solar, you put the solar, and it's not as successful as you hope and anticipate that it will be, and you're in the abatement agreement with the district for 10 years, could you, with the permission of the property owner, change the usage if you're still in a current contractual agreement with the district could you change the usage to something else before that 10-year period is up no this is just for stockyard solar right this is for a solar project with the amount of investment that we've that we've done so so it would have to stay as solar at least until the start of years that's say a stockyard solar yes yeah which is a solar <coughs> project that all of our okay. landowners have signed yes I, I can chime on to that one. There's there's terms within the agreements called maintaining a viable presence, right? And what we described in the application, what is certified by the comptroller, what is ultimately approved, has to be what is, you know, you know, materially related to what is described in that application. And then should the district enter into it, again, there's not only a requirement for us to maintain those operations for those 10 years, but years following that. Should something change, dramatic change, right? Well, then the, the school district, right, as, you know, legal rights to claw back on any savings that either one of the applicants received, et cetera, right? It's all spelled out there to protect the, the school district that should you grant this, these are all the obligations that the applicant has to live up to. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that kind of the board has more for you, we'll ask if not, we'll let Troy and the guys come up real quick. Um, so, at the, so for the projects that you've got going right now, <clears throat> if, if there has been a panel that has been damaged, what's, what's been the process of de decommissioning and getting rid of that panel? Where does it go? What happens to it? Yeah, I think we have our operations and maintenance is So actually the Saltillo project has not received, we haven't received yes, their panels yet. Yeah. No, sir. Yeah. Uh, I do know that they get set aside and sent back to the manufacturer mm -hmm. where I believe they're refurbished don't quote me yeah. on that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so you know, the materials that are used in the uh, panels, you know, a lot, you know, there are materials in that that are recyclable, right? And reusable. Um, you know, we work with our suppliers to have that, that set out, right, at the end of life. Uh, the, thing about, the thing about these panels is that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the materials, you know, are used for other things. Which really benefits the reuse and recyclability of, of these panels. So, what, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, which we hear from wind power, the turbine propellers, the blades, the blades are just buried. Yeah. Or that's what we see. Okay. Right or not. But, so, I guess that's the question in regard to what happens to the panel. Yeah, so you know on the blades, those are fiberglass, right? <coughs> they're, they're different sure. than, than a solar panel, right? That has copper or other, other type of special special metals in it. So uh, you can definitely, you know, reuse a lot of that stuff. It's a lot more bendable than, say, a fiberglass blade. And 
the glass that's on the solar panels, I hear a lot of people asking about breakage. It is a tempered glass. It's not a it's not a glass that's going to shatter and everything's going to fall out of it. It's just like your windshield in your car. Whenever it shatters or whenever it's broken, it just spider webs. That's what our panels do. Uh, so when we receive a, a broken panel off a truck or something like that, it's just spider web. That's why I say we just package those right back up, send them back to the supply. So that spider web, yes. There's is there leakage coming out of the spider no. web? Yes. There's nothing coming out of it. No, sir. Uh, I'll mention one last thing as far as community involvement and things like that. Uh, so you know, Enel really likes to get involved with the community. You know, we're doing this over at Saltillo ISD in Hopkins County and you know the Hopkins County uh, projects as well. <coughs> Uh, we have, we do like to work with our, with our, you know, the school, the local school district uh, for any STEM programs or scholarships. You know, we have a great rela relationship with Texas State Technical College, where uh, we have, you know, have donated money to them to help support some of their uh, department, you know, some of their uh, degrees that they have there, as as well as provide pathways for students to to go to a technical college if they so fit right. Uh, so uh, we also help out our local responders. You know, I know it's been mentioned that we haven't talked to them yet, but we, we always we always uh, and, and talk with them before we start construction. Um, it's a must, you know, things like that. So um, we, we like to do recreational projects with the county. We talk closely with, you know, economic developers, city council, uh, county commissioners, uh, judge, things like that as we get closer. Um, to the uh, later stage of development to see it, what projects they may have uh, that they haven't had funding for it, essentially or um, would like to do have an idea maybe they could use some help on things like that so uh, we do like to be very involved um, I know that uh, people think that we may have you know, snuck up into here to, to lease right you know this is all private property we've talked with folks um, there have been folks that have told us no we're you said okay. Um, we respect your decision and have moved on, right? So uh, everything's recorded at the courthouse, and uh, we definitely are trying to, uh, to be that way. So, any other questions for Zach? We're, we're hurt or red, but, uh, you know, with these solar panels, it will probably ruin the vegetation under it. It will just end up with snakes and rats and mice and dirt. Is there any truth to that? What do you do to keep that becoming just a desert under the Are you going around? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, you know, I would love to point to our Kaufman County. If you all have the time to go drive out there, uh, we can definitely give you a site visit. There's grass growing under the grass that was there before we started construction is growing under there now. Um, I've mentioned the dual use where we where we uh, you know look at the at the ground that we're putting our project on and have done the pollinators and the sheep and things like that to keep it a, a nice ecosystem. So, um, you know, it, you know, you definitely gotta look at what the terrain was before, right? You know, that project I mentioned that started construction in 2019, 2018, I mean, that was on top of a mesa in the middle of West Texas. There was really nothing growing there before we got there, right? So, uh, you know, when it comes out here where there's already native, native grasses, native prairie, things like that, all that stays the same. Um, as far as spraying goes, um, we actually use way less harmful chemicals than what probably the landowners are using, right? They just want to get rid of the weeds. Um, we, uh, we actually have a lot more, you know, red tape that we go through to, to make sure we're spraying what, what is good for the, for the land, so. Okay. Out at the site, I can't keep the grass mowed fast enough. I've got, uh, and at the end, we will have 13 robotic mowers that'll do nothing but mow the solar project so uh, before our contractor can leave the site they have to the, the entire site has to have 70 percent growth before they the contractor can leave the site and call it done so so y'all use very little herbicide we do uh right now we are using a herbicide uh to spray the weeds that are on the site just to to get rid of the weeds we do have a good amount of bermuda grass out there it's wild and it's taking off and now it's starting to choke out all the weeds uh, we do have on the fire mitigation plan we have to spray the fence lines and stuff with the herbicide to actually kill 
you know, for, for fire mitigation. So uh, those are some of the other things that we do. On that, um, I have seen what's at South Hillo and what's at Cunningham, and I know, I can't remember if it was one or both, around the poles of the solar arrays. The ground out away from it was mown, but around the poles there's lots of, you know, taller growth. Who so, takes care of that? So during construction? We do not concentrate as much around those piles, each pole that you're talking about. Uh, once operations takes over and construction gives it to operations, those robotic mowers are just like a Roomba in a house. They'll go right up to the pole, they bump it, they turn, but these are all GPS. Uh, they'll they'll mow around every one of them. I think yeah, I think the moral though is that there is grass to be mowed. Right? Yeah, yeah, there is so, a lot of grass, uh, and the fact that you even said that there's a lot of grass around the pile even shows that there, even during construction there's still vegetation yeah. that was already there still growing out there right so right. the concern there was though more of the fire risk with it being taller directly gotcha under, yeah yeah and around those poles so <clears throat> anything else for that yeah if there's no abatement what are the chances got to still build yeah so that's a question we get all the time and i know a few other folks have mentioned uh, in Texas, you know, I haven't seen us build anything where, you know, we haven't gotten an abatement, right? We've gotten abatements on, on mostly everything, you know? Um, it's definitely a conversation piece. It's a big driver while we come to the state, right? Because other states do not have it. Um, and really makes us competitive with our competition, you know, um, and just really drives up the, the economics, right? Uh, but I, like I said, I haven't seen us build one without some sort of, a, of abatement. So, and that is a very, you know, a common conversation on our end. You know, it, it's a decision made higher than myself. Uh, so, you know, I couldn't tell you, but it's a, it's a conversation that's brought up and I haven't seen us build one without some sort of, you know, abatement, so. Okay, on that, uh with this 313 sunsetting on December 31st, going forward, if y'all wanted to do solar, there would be no school district abatements. So yeah, you still have the you know the county abatement, right? You right. have the hospital district, water district, that also are taxing entities, the college district, whatever, what have you, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in my answer, you know, I've, that's that's what I'm getting at, right? You know, some sort of abatement. Right, that uh, we haven't built one without an abatement. So, and it's more of a limitation, right? Oh, you know, it's more of a tax limitation. But the left districts because you did not receive an abatement. Like I said, we haven't not received one. Okay. How about y'all? Have y'all left a district, or have you gone through this and not received? Girl, won't y'all come on up? You go. Yeah. Go, go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, we've got some of the questions that. that Y'all already answered, and right before them, I'm going to go through them that way because we want the people want to hear some of these answers, but they've already been answered by you, and then y'all may want to co-tell on with some of those. Yes. Yes. So you can go up here. Okay. Or, uh, you, can, you can take a seat. Okay. Thank you. Uh, while they're coming up here, let me just uh, a couple more. Here's some questions. And if will equipment be running 24 hours per day when preparing the land for installation? Uh, the answer is construction will occur during the day and we will work closely with the county and local community to minimize the everyday impact. That's from stockyards. Would y'all agree or do y'all run uh, that company 24 hours a day? Just normal working hours, right? Obviously, you need sunlight for more, most of this construction activity. So that's what we would do. Okay. And I had a, a question also, and it was answered by Nanel, but um, it was about who you hire. Do you hire, I think it was, uh, do you hire convicted felons or child uh, molesters, anything like oh, that? No, Samsung runs background checks, criminal background checks, credit checks, employment, post uh, uh, employment checks, and the references, right? They've got just a, a very uh, thorough background check that they run for all employees, drug testing screening, pre-employment screening. So, no, uh, Samsung, this is Jay he's uh, actually from Samsung Corporate and Jackson Walker. Um, you guys 
the test to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have yeah, that would be what that would always be done part of the hiring process. Unequivocally, no. Right. And that's from start to finish. We're talking to the temporary workers that come in to construct through the. Yeah, that would go the same. Absolutely. I mean, again, what you're bringing in is a reputable, you know, when we're looking at the scale of this investment of hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Just how we look at it, if we're going to go get a car loan from a local <laughs> lender and the way that they look at us, even on an amount of $50,000, imagine the checks and the balances and the reviews that are necessary to go in order to finance a $500 million project. So we go above and beyond in every way that we can, obviously to protect the community, to protect Samsung's investment, right, and to ensure that this is a successful project. Yep. And not just for y'all, but like when we interviewed architects for the bond, you know, they, that's one of their big sales is, is not only them, but the contractors they hire, you know, even that architect, they interview, so do y'all go through, like, you're going to have to hire, you know, people that, that bring rock in, that do different things, how do y'all bet those folks? Through, I mean, there's a general contractor, just like you use for these, what we call the EPC contractor, the Bechtels of the world. Some of the largest infrastructure companies in the world are the ones that have the capability of building a project like this. And so they bring in subcontractors as well as part of their process. We have to vet that what their sub vetting process is sufficient for our standards as well. But again, you have all of these people with some of the biggest, you know, most, you know, successful companies in the world, and they wouldn't have been successful if they don't walk through the checks that you're mentioning here, even all the way down to the subcontractor level. <coughs> One other, uh, oh, before I get this off of my screen here and scroll down, will the roads used uh, be made wide enough for local, tra local traffic to pass delivery vehicles and be repaired after the project is finished, and where does that money come from? Are roads going to be made at, we, uh, at least 18 feet wide? Talking about like the county roads. The answer got from uh, Stockyards is we will work closely with Franklin County to be good stewards of the roads and bridges we use during the construction, and we will cover the cost of any road upgrades needed to accommodate construction staff. So the projects also require a little maintenance once installed so they won't uh, attract all the traffic after construction it says we will work franklin county on road expansion requirements as needed funds used to repair road upgrades are provided by nl and i'm guessing y'all the same but like you know when i talk about a road we have i live out in the country and i travel these roads and i travel a lot of other roads we have better roads in franklin county than most counties <coughs> any county that i've been through and if you come in here and you come in front of somebody's place and they have livestock and you lay down some rock road, it's going to be a problem. So how is that addressed? Yeah, I mean, the same way. I mean, they made, they made mention of working with Franklin County on what's called a road use agreement. So before construction starts, we survey the roads. We see what county roads we're going to be using, ingress and egress for all the you know primary contractors and subcontractors for all the things coming in. We understand that inevitable, inevitably, there's going to be a truck that's going to be going down a road when somebody else is going the other way and there's going to be dust kicked up. There are certain things that we aren't going to be preventing, but everything that we can, we are going to try to go above and beyond to do so. So, and the way that we are going to do that with Franklin County, not it's not an abatement, it's just a road use agreement so that they understand the protections that the community has should something get damaged. Okay, where are those funds? We're posting bonds in order to assure that those could get repaired Right, and all of these things in place, the county and the project will be better protected within this agreement so everybody knows the commitment right, that each project is making to take care of the roads. I could, I could add a little bit to that too, just from our Saltillo project. You know, We do have a road maintenance agreement with Franklin County actually for 1018 out there, you know, around that county line, they own a portion of that. You know, We went through the process with uh, you know, Commissioner, uh, Cooper and Judge Lee and you know we brought it in front of the court uh, we also provided a $200,000 bond just for that small little stretch of road um, you know we a lot of our, our road upgrades happened on the Hopkins County side with Commissioner Bartley uh, he's, he was great to work with we had both you know both in both instances you know that's where an engineering and construction permitting team comes in we sat down with both of those commissioners, asked them, "What are you looking for? What are you, you know, what are you trying to avoid here?" Um, and came up with a, a plan that worked for everyone, right? You know, both the county and us signed up, signed off on that, right? Um, 
it's a common it's a common thing to put up letters of credit or bonds, right? It's just for that for that money to be there. Um, you know, a lot of times the the county does want to do that own that that work themselves because they think that they can do it better, which is great, right? Uh, and we're there to help help supply whatever whatever funding we need there. Um, I always tell the you know commissioners I work with, and I'm sure Sam sounds the same way. You know, I'm just a phone call away. Let me know if something comes up. We'll get it squared away. You know, Commissioner Bartley has definitely done that. Where maybe like a road truck you know has gone on the wrong road. I he called me. We got it taken care of. You know, an hour later, right? So uh, all this all this to say that we we have these you know personable conversations with commissioners and judges to accommodate for the roads. This is a big part of the project. Uh, we know that we're gonna be you know, bringing in some heavy equipment and we wanna make sure that we're leaving roads you know, how, we, how we found them. Now I, can't, I know there's been some issues in the county with some other developers, you know, definitely can't speak to how, to how those conversations went. I can just speak to what happened in our Saltillo project, so. And I'm sure Samsung has has similar conversations. <laughs> and we're, you know, it's not all about what it's done. It's about, you know, these folks that are around this that aren't getting anything, maybe even beating the car to pieces, going down the road because of, it's going to take a lot of rock trucks and different, it's going to take a lot, y'all know that, but, you know, if I'm one of them, what do I do? You know, what am I getting out of this deal? My neighbor over here, and I'm, I'm trying to tell this for the folks that are the landowners, that are going to be really, you know, it's not going to be just we vote on this and if it passes, they're going to be mad at us and the landowner for a few days. This is how long of a project to get through with y'all, maybe? It's about a year. About a year. There's two projects, that's two years. How long is yours? How long uh, you think ours, it's going to take? Ours is going to take, take a year. It's going to take a year. So I'm going to say if it's a year, if that'd be great, but if it's two years, that's a long time for these folks to be displaced, you know. You have advantages of the li living in the country and the disadvantages, but you know, they're not out there to have a highway in their front yard. So, you know, if they don't get a, t a break on their electricity or a, you know a guarantee of man when when things go bad we get electricity. You know, it's they're kind of the ones that because one of my questions was and I'm skipping all around here, but uh, you know, I'm not going to be seeking out a place next to South Hill. If I'm looking for a place, I'm going to go somewhere else probably. But what are the folks that are around it? You know, what can we do to help them out? I know y'all probably can't ask for some of that. The school board, we can't really ask for some of that. I can, but I can speak, uh, you know, at least at that project, we did offer good neighbor agreements for being next, being adjacent to the project, right? We've talked with a few folks at this project, at, in this area too, about that. Um, we definitely start getting those more into place as construction gets closer. Uh, but you know, with the good neighbor agreement, at least from our standpoint, we do provide a vegetation buffer uh, that you know we try to help maintain, and then you know maybe a small monetary you know amount every year, right, for being next to the project, uh, and just try to help help any concerns that they do have. So that those are actually in place at our South Tillo project. You know, we've started having those conversations with folks out here. Um, we like to provide those across the country. Um, because we know people do have concerns about that and you know we haven't really you know we've done a lot of studies on this and haven't seen any property value decreases from us being next to them we're very quiet uh, we're probably quieter than some of the kids rolling around but in through the through the county roads right so uh, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we my try kids to, didn't get to play outside for a year because y'all ran. Right, that's up enough. You need to walk out now. I am walking out with me. But just so you know, my kids did not. I said walk out now. Go ahead. No, absolutely. I mean, again, just echoing this, right? They're, they're a little bit further along. Vegetative screening. There's all of these things. Obviously, if damage to somebody's car happens. We need to learn about it so that we can, you know, compensate them for any damage that our project caused during the construction progress. I mean, process. So again, all of those things are in place. We try to control everything that's within our control, as well as our contractors, subcontractors. As far as the property value is concerned, I think you know everybody here maybe has that same feeling. Like I wouldn't want to live next to one, right, or whatever. But what we're actually seeing, and again from you know academia studies from the University of North Carolina, kind of studying property values around existing solar farms, we're not actually seeing that in property sales, right, of values increasing. 
So again, we can we can all have our own personal opinions on whether or not you would want to, but from a you know much larger scale, looking all the way across the country, the data isn't there supporting <coughs> recent values. We got to tone it down in here. I know we're all fidgety a little bit, but I'm trying to make sure we get them on camera. So if we're making some noise out here, then we can't have because a lot of folks that are probably having other obligations are going to want to come back and watch this on there on the YouTube or whatever that it's on. So I'm trying to be quiet and be respectful so y'all too. I couldn't hear him what his answer was. Okay, so we'll let you say talk a little bit louder. Sure. Just one more so time. again, kind of the last comment I made was regarding property values on surrounding, you know, surrounding a solar farm. Again, I think what I was commenting that, you know, a lot of people in here have that feeling, well, I wouldn't buy that piece of property that's next to a solar farm. But the University of North Carolina, they did a study, again, across the entire United States tracking sales and they didn't find any discernible difference or drop in market values for sales that occurred near solar farms. So again, we can all have our personal opinions, but we're, when you look at a lot of data all the way across the country, they didn't support that conclusion. So on behalf of Samson, would you answer the water question as Nell or as they yeah. to you? Would y'all respond to that as well? Absolutely. And you know, again, we, we know that <coughs> going through there, the idea that we're washing panels every two hours all throughout the year is just a myth. Right. Obviously, the answer truly, the amount of water that we could use to wash the panels on an annual basis is absolutely none. Right. We talked about how much rain you get. We know we never get enough as we want and all of those types of considerations. But under the assumption that we, let's say, wash the panels once a year. Right. If we wash the panels once a year, that's going to take what we calculated about a million gallons of water to do. Right. For our facility. But in comparison, an average household here in Texas uses 90,000 gallons. So that's just 11 households worth of water to wash it once. So the scale in which, I think Zach brought up another example, the scale in which water is used by a solar farm is the smallest amount as compared to any other form of power generation, right? You might like natural gas fired power plants. They use a ton of water to generate electricity, right? They have to have their own lakes in order to have active cooling for that. Again, an all of the above approach works, but the idea that solar farms use an inordinate amount of water is just not true. So. And that's not now or ever, not five years from now, it's not five years down the road? Or if anything, it's gonna even get more efficient. Yeah. Uh, Samsung's using some robotic cleaning solutions as well, right, where it's, uh, that they can even do it at night, right? Small robots doing it, even using less water than what is even required now. So actually what we expect to see is, you know, the, the industry continues to evolve. This is going to take even less. It's going to be more efficient. Yes, sir. Five or ten years, you're not going to say, hey, we got to start washing it. So no. They're not as efficient as they were when we first put them in, but they would be if we washed them. Yep. Okay. There will be none of that. No, and we're even projecting if, again, if that one wash a year needed to occur, we're not going to be using any local sources. So we would probably you know, pay, some, pay some water company for the truck. So whenever y'all put in a water tap at these facilities, it's just going to be like, Standard household water tap, like for your office. Yeah. You flush the toilet, and wash your hands. Yeah. Right. We'll need some plumbing for the O and M building. That kind of stuff. Water main going yep. into your facility, or five to ten or anything like that. Yes, sir. Um, I think there was a couple other comments again, kind of how it's going to benefit anybody else here. We said, where's the power going to go, right? Those decisions. Again, that decision isn't made by Samsung. It's not been made by Enel. It's not made by any of these, right? Troy's got to get things that electrons go where electrons go, right? Where there's demand for that power is where most of that power is going to go. So as you know, there could be some of that power being used here in Franklin County, but as he mentioned, you know, there's a whole lot more people in Dallas and there's a whole lot more people in Houston. So naturally, more of the energy is going to go there. But how it benefits us, we mentioned winter storm Uri and all of these things. Again, I mentioned the all of, all of the above approach. The more sources of generation that we have, the more sources of energy storage that we have, all of those things build a more robust grid to help prevent something like what happened in Uri's story happen again. So, Again, while we can't necessarily say when you flip the light in your living room that that you know, energy is coming directly from luminous solar, we know that the ability for you to flick that light on overall is better supported because luminous solar was built. Then on top of that, again, we mentioned some INS tax rates, right? How is this gonna benefit everybody? Literally, if you are a taxpayer in Mount Vernon ISD, if this project gets built. I think one of the other people made a comment that 
Okay, even if they pay this bond off, there's going to be another bond after, there's going to be another bond after, there's going to be another one. That very well could be the case, right? But with hundreds of millions of dollars more on the tax roll, what that does is the solar farms pay the majority of those bonds, not the individual taxpayers here. Now, they could choose to float a new bond. Or even if the existing bonds were in place, but all of these projects were built. What we see in many cases in similar school districts across the state with you know small to medium-sized tax bases with large investment, that allows school boards to cut the existing tax rates on every taxpayer here. Now, we don't have the numbers to quantify it. That's not a decision that they may not be making today. But the idea that, again, if the incentive is granted, it does not affect, we always pay full taxes on the debt service rate. And because we do that, that means you, individual taxpayers, may pay less to them because we are carrying most of the bill. So again, that's easier to show with numbers. I know that they're, they, have, they hire financial consultants and counsel to walk them through those decisions. Those could be some things in a future meeting we could share. But again, a tangible way that these projects could benefit you, even if you're sitting next to it or you're halfway across the county, but you're paying taxes to Mount Vernon ISD, these projects could, could allow you to write a smaller check every single year. So that was one other kind of comment that I had on kind of general benefits. So, so how, how many other projects does Samsung have in the state? I think they're starting construction on their first one here soon, right? Yeah, uh, we're expecting to have one uh, coming in next year. And where is it located? Uh, what is that? Where? My mom. Okay. Said, said where they can hear it out there. My said it again. Milo Kelly. Milo Kelly. In May. What was the question? Did you hear the question? Y'all hear the question? No. Uh, where, 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 do they have any other projects in the state? In Texas? They said they're starting one in May in Milan County. It's not owned by Samsung right now, but it was developed by Samsung. It was developed by yes. Samsung? Yes. Will this project uh, in this area be owned by Samsung or be subbed out? There will be a, a strategical decision at the later stage, but, but we are seriously considering to having one and also to develop and be invested by other investors. Uh, let's see if I can word this right. But my question was, how are we to be sure the school will receive funds after a fee 313 is agreed upon? And that's, you know, I know you get some up front. I'd like to get it all up front. And I would like to negotiate, you know, and talk about that. But, you know, is there something, and we'll be consulting with lawyers on that later on, but if we can't get all of our money up front, I know Samsung's pretty big, but y'all sell out. Or, or and you know, you know, you're up, whatever it is, in here that you talked about your company, you know, your reputable company. But if you go bad in five years and we have a 10 year, you know, agreement with you or a 15 at the school, are we out? Are those landowners out? If, uh, if in the kind of the cocktail on that too, if um, we change some leadership in Washington and this solar deal kind of goes to the wayside, in five or eight years, do the landowners, do they get their money up front or are they paid out, I guess, for those 30 years? What happens? Yeah, so I mean, they there's, out? there's legal protections just like anything. I mean, I can, we can focus mainly on the school district one and your council can probably answer it better, but this is a binding legal document, right? That isn't just being entered into willy-nilly, right? It's a very, very public process, applications reviewed by the comptroller to ensure it complies with state statute but ultimately it results again in a binding legal document that's not only reviewed by our legal counsel, but the school district's counsel is reviewed by the Texas Comptroller as well. And within that document affords all of the legal protections should there be some breach of the agreement. And similar things can be said about lease agreements with landowners as well. But and as far as that, you have no money. As far as administrations go, you know, I can just speak on, you know, during when Trump was in office, right? We had some of our best years during that. So it's really not an administration by administration um, issue, right? You know, solar has come so far, it's so cost effective, it's competing, driving natural gas down, uh, oil, everything else, right? So uh, there's, I would, I would not consider that as, a, as an issue. 
you know, if, if the admin, admin, admin strip change, you know, they change all the time, right? So, uh, but like I mentioned, we have some of our best years uh, under the Trump era. Do you have any other questions for those teachers? Um, I was just, Scott spoke a lot, can y'all say personally, like with the fires and working with the community and like what is y'all's plan? Do y'all do that and do y'all put in the same kind of um, environmental studies? Is it, you know, we heard from him, can y'all say too, what goes into this project as far as making sure the community is taken care of? Sure. I think the main point that Zach was mentioning is that what the needs of that particular community from one solar farm or one battery facility is compared to the next would be different. We could go build a battery facility in Dallas County and they may have already had that training and all the materials and other things that they would need to in the case that there was some sort of event. That may not be the case here. I know that there was somebody from the uh, volunteer fire department that came here and spoke. So the plan is, is obviously, right, to go above and beyond in any way that we can to plan for very, very rare inevitable, I mean, you know, instances that probably will never occur, but we have to be prepared for them anyways. But what that knowledge is, what their preparedness for it is, it differs. But our goal is to work with them so they are prepared, even in that very rare, very, very, very rare instance that there was some sort of failure. Have y'all gotten equipment before to different communities? I guess y'all haven't done it in Texas yet, but have y'all worked with counties in doing so? Yes. Mm -hmm. It, for example, the one in Mild County, Samsung working with their volunteer fire department, um, same as Zach said, to provide equipment training, um, special um, funding to provide those services. If y'all don't know, there's restrooms down this hall, and there's restrooms down this hall. We've been in here for a little while now, so if you need to excuse yourself for that, there's down here on the left, or down here on the left also on that, if we've still got a little more equipment to go. So let me follow up. I think what she has uh, heard her right. Maybe I didn't. <clears throat> but Zach spoke in regard to the to their project that a that an environmental study has taken place. Have y'all has that taken place? Yeah, it's this project yet? It's underway currently. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Other questions, board members? Have you got something? Yeah, we'll do some more questions. If you got something, y'all. <coughs> this is a good time to provide. Some you know, let me go through to kind of see. Oh, I think there was some question about Here's, here's the a question. Why don't they build solar farms closer to the metro areas? <laughs> they can, right? So available land is one of the biggest considerations, right? Access to transmission, available land, you know, all of those types of things. And that gets harder and harder to do the closer you get into metro areas. Yeah. So, so like I, I mentioned, we have one in Kaufman County, right? Which is yeah. right outside. What about like Kaufman County, 40? went from, I think, 12 to 16 schools in a school year, and I've been to some of those schools, why don't they put solar panels on top of those schools or on top of, you know, more houses that's going up? That's up to, that's up to them. I can speak to that, right? So um, that's the each school's personal um, preference, right? So. There's not really a good answer on why. Well, it's, it's not up to us, right? It's up to the, it's up to the, we're not, we're not a residential. Yeah, that would be your decision as a board. Yeah, we're not a residential solar company, right? So we don't, we don't have, we don't put up panels on, on rooftops, so. So uh, another benefit we'll talk about is the, the, the question I'll suppose is how many people the projects employ will have benefits and competitive wages. Both these projects, what was put into the 313 agreements was um, statutory or committing to one job, right? And that's basically that is an industry standard. Renewable projects in general, there isn't a, many moving parts with a solar facility. You simply don't need a ton of people to be working. It's not a manufacturing facility where you've got a ma manufacturing line. You need 200 people. No, these it, once they're built and the construction is is complete, those 250 construction workers, yes, they do leave, right? But then you will have some full-time employees. Samsung anticipates probably, even though in, in the application they've committed to one job, they're, they're, they're forecasting maybe having five jobs available at like $75,000 or more in, in, in wages, right? It's, uh, it, it's you know, competitive wages for these types of projects. And um, that's, it's, we put in there the, the two jobs, that's the minimum that they can, can commit right now, but they anticipate there could be more. 
And just, and again, those notes in the applications, they're not caps, they're not maximums, right? The applications are set up to state minimums, yes. right? So that's what it is. We anticipate there could be more, but what is the minimum requirement for this for a 313 application? It's these numbers, right? That's the same with the salary as well. Exactly. So, you know, everyone pays competitive rates to their technicians, uh, managers, <coughs> things like that. Um, you know, Samsung and Enel are definitely paying what, what things cost, right? You know, that's just what was set by the state comptroller's office as a minimum that you have to pay these, these folks. Yep. And is there an employee on site 24 hours a day? Like I mentioned, for the battery storage, it's real-time monitoring, right? Um, so we have folks on site and off site uh, doing real-time monitoring. As far as, you know, solar projects go, you know, people do have lives, right? So. Uh, you know, they work normal business hours. Uh, we may have a, an afternoon crew, you know, that may stay a little bit longer than five, but, you know, we do want to make sure we have a good work-life balance, you know, and not overworking our employees, which I'm sure Samsung. Well, and what I was getting at is if there's somebody there 24 hours, obviously there would be more than one person. Well, we do have security. We have, we have security because it is a generator, right? So, you know, it is connected to the power grid, has substations, switch yards. So we do have security that's there just to, you know, look after the, the facility, you know, and different shifts, things like that. As far as technicians, managers, you know, assistant managers, things like business. that. Uh, it's just business, yeah, whatever whatever they are working. But we, there is security because it is a, a generator for ERCOT, so. Guys, anything else you want to share with the board? No, like I said, you know, we've been a part of this, you know, we've been, whether it's representing renewable facilities or petrochemical facilities via this value limitation agreement process going back for me to since 2009, right? And again, we have seen this as a, one of the best ways, a very, very public process for constituents to learn about new possible developments, but also school districts to participate, get access to money that they normally can't. Um, and so, you know, we hope to obviously continue that relationship and we've seen it be very fruitful over the years. Yeah, board members, anything else for them? Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Shelly and Rick, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask if you'll step up just a second. I, I would like to get your, since this is for informational purposes, um, if you would step up just a second to answer a question for us. And I think answer a question for the public as well. Uh, if I read correctly in the paper today, I think our board, and I think a statement was made either directly or indirectly that this board, um, has possibly taken a bribe in regard to these projects. And I'm, I'm, I'm reading into the maybe the statement that they're regarding the $75,000 that each company had to put forward with the application process. So would you please explain what that $75,000 is used for? So the, uh, the application is used to pay the school district's costs associated with doing the due diligence for these projects. So all of that money goes solely to pay for your consultants and your legal fees to uh, to go through and analyze and make sure that, that the application is correct, that it's beneficial to the school district, and to produce your findings of fact and analysis. It, it is not, it's clearly by law not a bribe. So as well, is any of that $75,000 left over that the school gets back or receives in their fund balance. So it is a strict flow through from the company that goes along with the application process. And the, and the reason why is because by the district paying the application cost, that means that our work as your consultants, we owe a fiduciary duty to, to the school district. We have no duty, nor do we want any duty to the uh, to Samsung or to the other applicants, and so that way, by the money coming from the from the district, we have a, a strict duty to the district itself, and that's why it's done that way. And that money also affords the district to retain counsel without using your general funds okay. for that purpose. But was a little disheartening for sure to read in the paper that we had neighbors 
in our county that thought that this group of people right here were, were taking bribes to do something, that they would print it in the paper. So thank you for sharing that and making that public here tonight. Thank well, you. In addition, you have you have in your board policy uh, procedures and laws that permit you from, from doing that very thing. So, uh, so you, you, uh, you take your responsibility seriously and, and you do not Okay, in regard to, I think something else was brought up. Let's go ahead and sit and talk about that just a little bit. In regard to the 313 applications that were brought forward, in the in the law requirements in the 313, regarding the number of jobs and some things like that, as you heard were mentioned, that the board was amiss, and maybe the word was not amiss, I'm not exactly what was stated, that we were, um, what was the word being used? That, that, that you, you, you essentially that we violated, yes, violated, law, that you violated yes. the law by by not following the requirement as to the number of jobs and it, and at this stage number one the district has been asked by the applicants to uh, to waive a certain amount of the ten job requirements but the district hasn't made a decision. But so, is that allowable by law? But it is it is allowable law, by law. And again, this the statute itself is a, a one size fits all for all possible projects, whether it's nuclear energy, uh, a manufacturing facility, uh, renewable projects, all of these things. And so the ten job, the ten number of job requirements is is there mainly because of manufacturing uh, projects that <coughs> generate a lot of jobs. These renewable uh, uh, solar projects, they don't require that amount, amount of jobs. And it is allowed by law to, and it's, it's the, the standard throughout the state as well as other places to agree to uh, 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 waive the jobs down to like two jobs, one or two jobs. And, and again, the real benefit is, is coming from the investment and the tax rate uh, revenue generated, not really from, from jobs. And you, you really are not getting that much of an additional benefit by having 10 jobs instead of two jobs. There, there, there's not a real monetary significance to the district, to the community as a whole. By waiving that, it can choose to do so. Because you haven't made that decision yet. Okay. Yeah, we had a public speaker, and we're going to get a lot of stuff that we have to have counsel on. But you know, it was mentioned about lawsuits and jail time. You know, we're going to get a lot of bloods and different things. So that's why we're asking some of these questions. You know, and we expect y'all to keep us out of those binds, but sometimes we have to be very transparent why he's asking these questions up here. Because if I'm on the other, if I'm on the opposite side of it, I'm gonna, you know, there's two good sides to argue here. If I'm on the opposite side, I'm gonna come up with what I can. And we're the ones that need to be bluffed right now in the voting no, which to me like. So, are we liable as board members for anything that's taken place so far? You, you, you have not, nothing. I'm not aware of anything at this stage in terms of what y'all have done related to the applications, nor do I anticipate anything uh, coming up that would, that would put the district in a position of violating the law. But that's what we're here for, is to make sure that you follow the law and to represent your is there a law that says that we can or can't negotiate things? Like, what if I want a million dollars per fire department the first, you know, up front, and then I pledge a million dollars for the next five years? Can the school board negotiate that? No, that's, that, that is between the company and the county and the fire departments and, and those folks. It's what all you are asked to do and all that you have the authority to do is to agree or not agree to a value limitation. Can that be done before we accept the, the <clears throat> I know we've, what we've approved the application 
We've accepted it, but we haven't approved it. That's right. That's right. So by, by accepting it, you, you're not bound to make any decision. So, but can the county negotiate something like that with these companies before we approve it? Uh, I'm sure they can. If, if they choose I've told to do the so. county doesn't vote on some things until after the school board does, but you know, these people that are here, myself, and these board members, we want to know. You know, I'm asking questions, what do we get? We don't get electricity out of the email. Electricity goes into the grid and it's out there, so it's nothing that we're getting out of that, but I'm just trying to figure out what can uh, we as a board do to say, you know, if we agree with this, but what can we do to say to these people out here that we're trying to take care of you? We're not just looking out for our kids, but we're trying to take care of you. What what can we legally do? And I know that you know, there's probably some stuff in there. And I, I've asked those questions, and I kind of know, but I want the public to know, can we or who does? Who can start some negotiations to make this deal say, you know what? I don't really want it. I sure don't want to look at it. But if they come, this is going to be took care of. This guy right up here that comes to my place probably once every two years and fights a fire. Are these folks that are first responders that are, you know, if, if my one of my kids or my wife has a car wreck and they're in the ditch, they're the first ones there. What can I do to take care of them? Because they're the ones out there taking care of me and my family. And also, you know, they're, I want to take care of them and their families. So... What can we negotiate? So, so first of all, by doing what you're doing and having this meeting and raising these concerns, you're telling these applicants what what is expected of them with regard to in, in this community. So, so I, I think that that's the first thing. But in terms of, of you know, with this this volunteer fire department, I mean, if if, if they and whoever their responsible parties are that negotiate those deals, they should start talking to these people tomorrow about about putting that training in place. And it's up to it's up to them to do that. And certainly, this is an encouraging process for that to happen. Uh, but the the school district has a certain amount of authority with regard to what you have jurisdiction over, what you can agree to, and what you can't. And and most of those things are outside your authority to to negotiate as it relates to somebody else's land or another governmental entity's uh, needs and responsibilities. The, the, they have to do that themselves. You can't do it for them. Or you have the authority to do it for them. But, I think by raising the concern and showing that, that, that the district is concerned about this issue, despite the fact that it's not within your purview to make a decision, you're encouraging them to be uh, good stewards and in in to, to do those things. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so pretty much we can't do anything if somebody else knows as much can. Because, you know, Ms. Olson, is that right? You know, she. She made a pretty good point earlier of, you know, she's going to say, y'all don't, these companies don't care in different things. And I know there's, y'all do projects all over, but we're not South Hill or Cunningham or Kaufman. This is Franklin County. And we're going to do a, you know, we want a whole lot more if this goes through than what these other counties would probably ask for. So I do because so I, I don't <laughs> want it to be, you know, if it's an eyesore, I want it to be. I'm trying to be pretty transparent here, but I want it to be worth that eyesore of what these people are going to have to go through in these two or three years and seeing the blinking lights at night, hearing the construction and the and the dust and all. Is but you're telling me, I guess that's not in my range to be able to ask any of that. And specifically, in addition to that, the district cannot negotiate a benefit above what the statutory maximums are within the 313. So you're also restricted in terms of how much in terms of monetary value to the to the to the district. But with regard to firefighting, for example, I mean that's that's you're, you're you don't provide firefighting services. It's not your responsibility to make sure that it's that that training is, is done, and so you, you just don't have the authority to do it. I mean, 
mean, but I, like I said, by you raising the concern and and these applicants are saying that they go to the fire departments and they provide what they need, I, I, uh, you're, you're, you're raising the issue. But can you go out and negotiate something special? Not as a school district, no. See, that puts, that puts us in a bad spot. We can't negotiate that. But if we say, yes, they come, and we say, no, they don't come, well, that puts me in a pretty bad spot here, you know what I mean? Because you companies, I'm trying to get something for my people, and which the school are my, is my people, but these other folks are my people also. So that's, that's why I'm so torn right now, is because, you know, all of you in here, put yourself in our shoes. You know, it's pretty tough shoes to be in right now, because we have some different responsibilities. And I'm just thinking out loud and talking out loud while we're in here. That's why I'm telling you, we hear your concerns. It's very beneficial to different things. You know, I see the sign you're holding up, but every one of you in here, or all of these board members in here on social media, and we know some of you fought very hard, pretty hard, to make sure we didn't get this bond passed. You know, if we had different if they fought as hard to help us improve the school as they did against this, and I understand some of these things, but it would be different, but we're in a pretty good spot. That's why for Samsung and NNL, you know, I'm trying to see what can we get. Go big or go home is how I look at this stuff. And how, you know, how do we, I know you set the standards, you know, when you do this for Franklin County, you gotta do it for somebody else. But, but if it's out of our hands, it's out of our hands. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for answering the questions. You bet. Dr. Brainstrom, are you still there with us? I'm sure am. Okay, great. Thank you for being with us tonight. Would you please uh, share a little information about yourself and then uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to share with us uh, in regards to. Uh, I think you sent us a, a presentation that you'll share with us in regard to uh, solar energy. Uh, do, do you want to put the, the presentation on the screen? I, I don't think I can share my screen. I have it. It's on the. It's on now on the screen. Hang on. I'm okay. Sure. Yes. Yes. This. I see it. Hang on a second. I'm gonna share it on the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, now all good. So if you could just go to the first slide, then, then I'll get started. This tells about the numbers. Okay, we're there. Okay. All right, so on the, on the screen, I still see all of them rather than just the first one. I do if I look at, um, yeah, let me just see what I'm, I, I, I think the first slide should just be um, the title and my name and title. Yeah, exactly. Okay, there, there we go, thank you, yes. Okay, there we go, yeah, now I can see it on the screen. Well, anyway, thanks a lot for, um, for, for, for the invitation, and I just would like to, um, to clarify one thing that I, heard uh, a little earlier, and, and that is to clarify that I am not a consultant, right? I'm not um, hired or paid by anyone in the room. I get one salary, and it's um, thanks to the fabulous and fantastic Texas A&M University, where I've worked for almost 20 years, and, I, and, and so that, and uh, my connection uh, to this is the fact that I teach a class called Geography of Energy. Uh, I've taught it for quite some time. I also do research in the area of, uh, of impacts of, of uh, wind power uh, on communities. And I've also studied, uh, and, and so here I know I am not making any claims to be an expert on the impacts of utility scale solar 
PV, but I do have um, the ability to read the scientific literature and to synthesize it and to make certain claims uh, about kind of what we know. And, and of course, I'm doing this uh, because I include this kind of material in the class that I teach to undergraduates uh, that I have taught for a while. And without any reference to a particular uh, project, a particular solar project. Uh, so if we get uh, uh, an edit. Another thing about my title is um, I'm responsible for undergraduate education in a, in a fairly large college of arts and sciences that encompass everything from math and physics to um, English and history. So if you could go to the second uh, slide, please. Okay, so my, in terms of my educational background, it's in uh, geography from Texas A&M for uh, coming close to, to, to 20 years, and uh, yeah, fantastic university that's been very good to me and, and my career as an academic. I've been teaching geography of energy for several years, and that's kind of where this material um, comes from. You know, I did not, uh, you know, what I do here is something that I, I, I talk to undergraduates about all the time who, who, who are interested in what are the benefits of solar, what are the benefits of wind, what are the drawbacks, and so forth. And indeed, one of the big um, themes about any energy topic is that there are a lot of trade offs between you as individuals and, um, and some of the consequences because you don't get energy for free. You have to build structures and you have to build systems to, to be able to harness whether it's fossil fuels or or solar radiation or, or the wind resource. So anyway, my, my research has been on wind power in, in West Texas where I studied uh, in Nolan and Taylor County, some of the first places in Texas to, uh, to receive large scale wind operations. And I've studied uh, uh, what the stakeholders there think about wind power, wind energy, wind farms, and I've also studied the distribution of royalties among, uh, among the wind, among the, the landowners who have received wind on their properties. And I've studied wind power in Brazil, where it's a, we have a very, very different context, mainly because uh, land tenure or land ownership is unclear in, in many cases, uh, uh, not the case in Texas, of course, but in, in Brazil and in many parts of the developing world, there are some conflicts because of, of insecure land title and land tenure. So it sounds very strange to an audience in, you know, near the Metroplex uh, that uh, it can be unclear who owns what, but this is indeed the case in many parts of the developing world. Anyway, this sh very short presentation, I'll just be synthesizing what we know in the peer-reviewed scientific literature about environmental impacts. And as I emphasized earlier, this is not about a particular utility scale solar PV site or proposal. So the next slide uh, shows just an example of what some of this peer reviewed literature is and, and where it's published. So it, as scientists, we have a fairly rigorous process of peer review when we try to get uh, some of our, our, our findings and our results into the, into the academic literature. Uh, again, just a sampling of of these, of, of what I've been uh, The next slide, please. All right. This uh, this aims to define what it is that we're talk talking about, and I think this is pretty important to, to as a first principle in trying to understand what's uh, what's out there on the internet and the literature. And and we're talking here about utility scale solar PV, which is has a certain uh, capacity. We're not talking about concentrating solar or CSP which is a, uh, basically a broad array of mirrors that concentrate solar radiation onto a particular point to heat, uh, to heat a substance that then will generate steam and, and so forth. And certainly we're not talking about decentralized or rooftop solar, right? These are three different things that shouldn't be confused with one another. 
uh, I suppose one could say that technology as utility scale solar, but decentralized so solar, of course, feeds the, the household or the building first and then distributes to the grid where utility scale solar distributes to the to the grid. What I uh, did not do here is to, is to put any information about that's something that we're seeing relatively recently in the United States improves, gets more cost effective as we see, uh, uh, and, and this is also an adjustment um, to certain market conditions where it can be very it can be more lucrative to store the energy and release it in batteries than to uh, than to just deal with the intermittent nature of of solar, which is it works when the sun's up, but not when the sun's down, right? So that is not part of this, and um, and I did just simply didn't have much chance to do any synthesis of, of, of that. Um, so what do we know? We know that as, as a second big principle, we know that energy, any, any energy system has impacts that are potential, uh, that are eventually observable. They're direct and, in effect, in, and indirect. And this goes for everything, of course, from nuclear, hydro, to coal, natural gas, and so forth. So solar is, of course, not um, uh, immune or it does not escape this basic principle of, of any energy system that it does have impacts. Uh, we also, I think another point here is that it's important to identify what are modeled or predicted impacts compared to um, impacts. And, and what we, and, and the literature is, 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 uh, is a mixture. Uh, models that predict what we and, and other kind of, you know, foundational sciences, uh, but it's also based on the very uh, messy and complicated process of making direct measurements about direct and indirect impacts of solar. Uh, and again, in any anything you read on the internet or a study that claims to be a study should be filtered through this lens of are they modeling something or have they directly measured? Uh, something, and then that leads to the next point of of how do we know what we know, and and we have a certain amount of studies that are what's called observational. In other words, these are scientists who go to sites of, of solar PV and make measurements in those sites. These are expensive, time-consuming, very difficult studies uh, to do. Uh, then there's a different kind of difficult study, which are the modeling. Ones, and that is that you make certain assumptions about the way the world works based on solar radiation, the behavior of animals, wheat growth, whatever. Take your variable and you develop a model that helps you make predictions. So, so all of this is to say that it's important when, when you come across facts, uh, alleged facts, uh, out there in the internet, on, uh, in the literature and so forth, that you apply a handful of principles, right? What solar system are they talking about? Uh, is there any uh, kind of um, suggestion that uh, there are no impacts? Because that's of course untrue. Uh, but then, are there are there modeled or predicted or actual empirically measured uh, outcomes uh, in an observational setting, or are they purely uh, modeling? That's not to say that modeling is better or worse, or observational is better or worse. But this is just about how we know what we know, and uh, and, and and what it is that we that we know. Um, right. The next slide tries to provide you with a kind of a, a grid or a matrix for thinking about uh, what utility scale solar PV uh, means in terms of the environment. This is, this is nothing about the social aspects or the grid stability or anything like that. This is simply about the, which, are, which are significant, but I didn't have uh, the ability to, to put all of that together for a short presentation. But what we know is that there's three basic stages for PV construction, and I think there are good questions that can be asked of each of these uh, phases, right? So in other words, to not kind of break, to not um, consider the solar project as one massive kind of entity, but rather to think about what it means in terms of impacts at these three different stages. And the three different stages, of course, happen in 
in very different moments or periods, right? The construction phase is relatively short, right? And it, of course, involves interventions in the environment for the construction of roads, uh, perhaps, or not, right? It depends, that's a, a point to, that you can use to evaluate any proposal is what kind of road and construction. Where is the transmission going to be based and where are the substations? And of course, for this project, for, for a project that involves batteries, then it's like, well, where are the batteries? Uh, going to be located as well. We also know that there's vehicular activity at, at this stage and all subsequent uh, stages, and we know that there's a, going to be a certain amount of surface uh, vegetation removal or so forth, right, to make the site ready. And these can be, these are going to be different at the operation phase, which obviously is going to last a lot longer, uh, right, perhaps 20, 30 years or more, depending on the projected lifespan and so forth. And at that point, uh, something to consider is the overall footprint of the PV array or farms and, and so forth. There's still vehicular activity, although substantially less than at the, at the construction phase. And there is, of course, maintenance for the site and, and panel washing, right? Some of these questions I've heard, um, you know, since, since the start of this a couple of hours ago that, that were raised. And these are good questions to ask of the operation phase as well. What is your protocol for vehicle activity? What's the protocol for the maintenance of the site and the panel washing and so forth? And then there's the decommission phase, which of course is uh, in some future time horizon when uh, PV is removed or, or replaced uh, perhaps the site is restored, or perhaps it's it's put into a different use, and and then there is uh, an off-site end-of-life PV disposal. This last one here, I just need to spend a little bit of time on, uh, no, noting that that the that the disposal of the uh, PV um, does not appear to happen at the site. It happens in a manufacturing or recycling facility where with the proper worker protections uh, there can be safe disposal of, of the metals inside the panels which in turn are protected by that tempered glass that that the industry uh, uh, project developers and managers uh, talked about so for each of these there's a clear uh, there are some potential effects of course that's you know any way of generating energy has these and there are of course in in a responsible society like ours there are ways to mitigate that effect and and uh, and, and some of the mitigation uh, uh, things that are, are in that last column where there are washing protocols right what are those what do those look like uh, is there a project layout that is amenable to in terms of avoiding landscape fragmentation that is if you're interested in in, uh, in, in the way that animals and, and pollinators, insects and so forth might use that site. And uh, what kind of dust uh, protection mit mitigation is there, which of course is more, far more important in arid and semi-arid environments than, uh, than, than in more, more humid environments. Light and noise pollution, that's another uh, issue of course that can be mitigated with a certain kind of project layout that is thoughtful and, of course, aims to, uh, to, to reduce those, those impacts. If we could go to the next slide, I've tried to summarize for you some of what, uh, of what we know. Uh, that's uh, the other way, sorry. Or I, I think I have, yes. Yes, so, so what we know is that, is that at the manufacturing stage, of PV, there are there is potential for toxic exposure uh, for the workers uh, in manufacturing facilities that do not take proper precautions for their workers. This exposure, we do not think, extends to the site of installation, right? So, so I think so. Yes, there is potential toxic exposure, but norm, but that does not appear to happen at the PV site. It appears to be something that could happen depending on the right on, 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 on worker safety pro protocols at the manufacturing facility and at the, at the decommissioning site. But those are, norm those are not normally places where, the, where solar is installed. There's a, a, a this is going to sound very fun, very strange, but there is a vigorous 
scientific debate about the microclimate effects. Uh, so what this means is that scientists are not really sure what exactly is the microclimate effect. And this is because there are studies with some contradictory results about, uh, in terms of the observation of, of, of solar PV farms. And, and one of our problems is that most of the studies have happened in arid environments where you have a lot more bare ground, right? A lot more bare, bare soil. You have, uh, you know, certain humidity, temperature characteristics that of course are not representative of every place that solar PV is being built. Uh, what is, uh, I think, clear, right? So there's a debate about that, kind of what happens to surface air and soil temperatures. What is um, kind of more clear is that what matters a lot is what was the site like before uh, solar PV was was constructed. And, and the scientific literature recalls those reference conditions, that is pre-solar farm. And it also matters what is the surrounding uh, land cover like, right? These things do indeed matter. And so that's why it is not a clear-cut, um, single and simple answer about well, what does happen to soil moisture, what happens to surface air in the immediate vicinity around uh, around a solar farm, right? There there is still room for that um, for that science to to develop. I think similar things can be said about uh, what the literature says about biodiversity in terms of flora and fauna, and it depends on the lay. It depends on a lot. It depends on the layout of the solar farm. It depends on the species characteristics and how well they may adjust or adapt uh, to the particular layout and the particular uh, structure. It depends on, again, the reference conditions, that is, the conditions of the site before solar was, was built, because they're not all the same, right? There's wide variability in terms of the locations that are eventually used um, uh, for solar. So the answer to two, I think, big questions uh, might, well, I'm not sure if I heard microclimate being talked about in the, in the three-minute sessions. Uh, I did hear a little bit about uh, biodiversity, but it, it's, it's a big depends question, right, on, on what the layout of the site will be and what are the pre-solar pre farm uh, conditions. One thing I did not have a chance to synthesize is an emerging area of, of trying to understand what is it that grows under solar PV in conditions that are not the desert, right? So in some ways, you know, studying what grows under solar PV in very arid environments is, let's just say, not exactly a terribly productive scientific endeavor compared to what grows under solar PV in areas where you get 20, 30 inches of rain a year. Uh, and and that's uh, we just uh, don't have enough knowledge about that. But uh, but that's again an area for uh, you know to, to figure out in the future. Uh, so the second to last point is about is putting is trying to put solar PV into context with other renewable generation types. So when we think about those types of generating electricity that don't generate the SOX and the NOx, right? The precursors to smog and air quality problems, those power generation types that don't give us uh, uh, mercury pollution and so forth, right? Those kinds of, of, uh, of, of power generation types that don't give us uh, greenhouse gas emissions. When we think about those, solar clearly gives a, has what's called the smallest spatial footprint. In other words, it uses the least amount of land compared to competing renewable power generation types, right? So when we kind of compare kind of like with like, right? I mean, I think you can compare coal with, with, with natural gas. That's like with like, right? A small footprint, but you rely on basically an underground forest, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. When you rely on the fluxes that nature gives us through wind and solar and the hydrologic cycle, hydro, uh, we find that um, actual measurements, right, that, that we get a, a pretty efficient use of land for the amount of power that is being generated. And then the last uh, point here in terms of a synthesis is that I think when we look broadly at all ways of generating electricity, 
uh, we find significant um, social benefits, which basically means public, and this is about um, air quality uh, 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 impacts, which of course from solar, um, well, don't really exist, at least in any kind of comparable way with, with fossil fuel-based power generation. And then we have the environmental benefits uh, in terms of, say, waste disposal, the way we extract uh, uh, coal or natural gas from the subsurface, and so on. And the final slide gives you a handful of references to experts, people who are, can, who are actively conducting research in the field of, of, of trying to understand what is what solar PV does or is doing uh, to, to the environment in a broad kind of ecosystem uh, science way. Again, just a handful of, of experts. I'll note that the second one, Greg Barron Gafford, is someone who has studied what's called agri-voltaics for quite some time. That is, can uh, crops be grown underneath solar PV? And, and if so, what uh, what's the productivity? What are the benefits to landowners, right? How, how can we have both? happening in the same space. And then you know, a handful of other scholars who have studied uh, different aspects of, of solar from different perspectives, ranging from, from social science to, uh, to, uh, to kind of the, the other sciences. So that's what I have for you. And again, to emphasize, I am not a consultant. This is kind of, of information that I regularly uh, give to my undergraduate uh, class at, at Texas A&M who take my Geography of Energy class. And uh, with that, I think I will just uh, uh, end it right there and wish you all uh, best wishes. I, I wish that I could have traveled from College Station to, to Franklin County and Mount Vernon, but that was a little far for me to do on, uh, you know, with family obligations and, and other duties at, at A&M. Dr. Brandstrom, thank you. We appreciate your time and sharing your review of the research with us tonight. <laughs> Does anybody have a picture of this for your studies? It'll be on the, you watch the video, but for these studies up here. We don't have much longer because we just have a few action items and we'll roll through them pretty quick. So thank y'all for being patient. And he did this on his own time. Stayed up late the evening to, to talk to us about that. So let's see here. We'll move on to item four, discussion items. Item five. Item five. Yes. Consider approval of the consent <coughs> agenda. Back here, board, look here. Any questions on the consent agenda? Motion made by Josh, seconded by Robert, all board. 7-0 on that. Item 6, our action items. Consider approval of the modify Saturday school for compensation for 2022-2023 on the stipend list. Quickly, uh, it was $75. We moved it to an hourly rate. That way, if we have a reduced, like maybe only two hours of Saturday school versus a four-hour window, we have two teachers that want to work Saturday school instead of one teacher to divide that. We moved it to an hourly rate and increased it. So a teacher that works a full four-hour window would earn one hundred and twenty dollars instead of the seventy-five dollars, which also lines up with our tutorial hourly rate. Hey, is it hard to get anybody to come up here on Saturday? Yes. Can't see anybody. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any more questions on that? All right. In a motion, we approve the modified Saturday school compensation on 2022-2023 stipend list. Motion. Motion by Linda. Second. Seconded by Scott. All four. <laughs> Seven zero. Consider adopting MBISD resolution approving the investment policy strategies and investment officer training. Uh, this is the uh, review of our investment policy that we do every year. Um, nothing has changed. 2019, so it was in your packet to review. Any questions on that? Any motion for that? Motion made by Leanne. Second. Second by Linda. All four. 7 0. Item C. Consider 
and approve extracurricular status request resolution for our 4-H organization, Dr. Stella. Bring this to you tonight because we have, you've approved the one for Franklin County, but we do have some students who are transfer students to Mount Vernon uh, who live in Titus County, and they are a part of the Titus County 4-H uh, organization, and um, so we're asking that you approve to, uh, uh, to allow the for or to allow the um, uh, Ag Extension uh, the people from Titus County to be a part of the adjunct faculty as well, so those students can uh, be a part of that also that are in Titus County, not just Franklin County. Okay, I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Brooks, all for. 7 0, last one. Consider approval of tip spender national bus sales for purchase of two activity buses and two uh, special ed buses. We went out for. Uh, for RFQs, those have been presented to you in regard to where those came back. Um, I'd like to say that uh, there were buses left, uh, but that was the, the issue I was running into. Of course, because of the cost of the bus, we couldn't do anything until we had a board meeting. Uh, at the time, they had 25 of these buses available. They have sold these buses now, and um, so the ones that I was wanting to make the recommendation for, they were 14 passenger buses. Uh, we were looking at getting two to be 14 passenger buses to be used for, uh, considered to be activity buses. Uh, we were going to use two for special ed buses because they had uh, 12 seat, or seats for 12 plus two wheelchairs. Those have since been sold, uh, but we do still have a need. And we have a need for to transport smaller groups of kids, whether it be uh, kids in ag or uh, other extracurricular things that we have, uh, baseball teams, volleyball teams, when it's just one team. It's less than 14 students, um, and I would like to go ahead and, and make the recommendation if you would approve. And what we've done, where this money is coming from, we have um, set our we have um, uh, designated fund balance for transportation purposes, and I'd like to use um, some fund balance to be able to do that. I'd like to go ahead and, with your approval, I'd like to make the recommendation to go ahead with the seals before. Um, bid of $53,092.10 to go ahead and order for purchase uh, two of the um, two 20, 23 Ford Transit 14 passenger buses, or excuse me, 14 passenger uh, transit vehicles. Uh, again, that bid price was $53,092.10. What that would allow us to do, that would allow us again to, to transport kids instead of having to use two Suburbans are a big yellow bus uh, on, on opportunities of students or transportation less than 14 and allow us to use that. What about the other ones in the future? Well, we we'll, we'll, have to, that. Well, well, we'll have to come back on that. Again, I was hoping, I, as of yesterday when I talked to him, they had two, talked to him today, they sold those two. He has sent me a couple emails. He has some different opportunities, but that's not what we've got the RFQ for. So I would have to come back to you. So if we get a time crunch on those, we'll have to call a special meeting. That way we can get up here and get them bought before they're gone. And, and, and so with that, I mean, so the RFQ I put out was uh, for basically used. These had these were all less than 10,000 miles. Uh, there was a company that had purchased them pre, pre-COVID. They didn't get to use them. National Bus Sales bought them for, from them, and that's why they had them available now, uh, which was, again, good for us, but it was also good for everybody else. Uh, another company that um, that I know that does uh, sells used buses contacted me and we had nothing available, and they said there is nothing available. Uh, again, we just missed the opportunity. On this and I hate that, but, but 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 I would still like to make the recommendation for us to to use some of that designated fund balance uh, for the two uh, 2013. Again, we'll place the order for those in the year. Do we need to specify if they're going to be uh, activity or sped buses? No, but these, these will only be activity buses. Okay. These, these will, these will, why we will probably, we will have either wrapped or put to make them to where they're designated not burning activity okay. buses, the fans. So the sped buses they, they, they will not, the they will not be on the route. Okay. Correct. Okay. So we need a motion to approve the tip spender national bus sales for purchase of two activity buses. Yeah. Motion made. Motion made by Linda. 
seat up there, right there. Second by, which is the 530 92 No, it's not through national rules. This is through sales people. Yes, sorry. Yes. The recommendation is for a 2023 Transit 350 passenger, 148 inch long wheelbase, uh, 15 has count the drivers, 15 passengers, uh, for a total price of 53,092.10 times two. From Sealsby? From Sealsby, yes. So the national buses were out, right? Yeah, the national buses, buses are, are not there now. That was our original. Yes. <coughs> yeah. The purchase price times two. So, yeah, as printed in there on under Sealsby. Did you second that, Robert? Okay. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And it'll, it'll take some of the burden off our, our, train, our route buses, for sure. Any further questions on that? Motion by Linda, second by Robert, all board. Thank you. So no uh, information items here right before we roll on. Do we have any uh, enrollment totals? I think the enrollment total as of October 1st was 1572. Where did we, right. we start at? Do you remember? Um, uh, September 1, we were still 1572. August 11th, we were 1495. Okay. All right. The, uh, October 1st last year was 1522, so we're up 50 kids in last year. Okay. At 8.24, the board convenes in the closed session for personnel matters pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551074 uh, to discuss commercial or financial information regarding business prospects with, uh, with Mount Vernon ISD may conduct economic development negotiations pursuant to Texas Government Code 551087 and to consult with legal counsel as necessary to address legal concerns, implications, and questions regarding the posted agenda items Pursuant to Texas Government Code 551071. Nine fifty-seven. Nine fifty-seven p.m. Board convenes back into open session. Number ten, personnel report. We need to. Uh, do we have any? Um, we don't have any professional contracts. We do have one resignation to acknowledge. That is Mr. Jesse Polo, who was the um, uh, custodian supervisor. Uh, he, re he resigned at the end of August. And um, after, I think he worked here for six years, five or six years. Okay. The only thing, only one we had. Okay. Any further business? Okay. No, sir. There's no further business, and we will adjourn the meeting at 9.58 p.m. Thank you.